Well, hello, everybody. Uh, I want to introduce tonight Eric Tokel. I've been very excited to hear this story for a long time. Uh, forgive me as I kind of skip the normal intro of you know what's going on with the uh, the COVID closures and uh, fire restrictions, uh, I, mostly because not much has changed, but I'm also extremely excited to hear this story uh, ever since I uh, Eric messaged me on Facebook and told me that he took his Volvo 240, uh, 85 to 240, uh, well, I'll let you go over that detail, sorry, um, out into the woods. I was, uh, and it was perfect timing because I've been getting a lot of questions lately from people about, hey, where can I take my car camping? Can I take my car camping? Is it okay? Is it a good idea or a bad idea? Well, I thought this is a perfect opportunity. Eric just did this, provided me with some pictures so we can share with y'all, uh, and some pins on the map so that we can show some locations. Um, and I, I personally, I can't wait to hear his story. So, uh, with that in mind, I thought I'd share it with everybody else in the world. And um, with that in mind, I'm going to start off by basically asking Eric uh, roughly. Oh, Dylan's joining us real quick. Let me add him in here real quick. Hey, Dylan, how's it going? Hey, how's it going? Excellent timing. We've only been on for a little bit. I just did the intro and said that, forgive me, everybody is like not going to do the normal intro. I'm so excited to hear Eric. Eric, Dylan, Dylan, Eric, uh, hear Eric's story. That I, we're just Hello, gonna Dylan. Hello, hey. everyone. We're pretty much just going to jump right into it. So uh, we've already got nine people watching. That's fantastic. Uh, if you like this show, please, it would mean a tremendous amount to me if you gave me a thumbs up. Uh, please consider subscribing if you like what you see on the content of this channel. Um, without further ado, uh, I'm going to let Eric kind of introduce himself. Uh, maybe the first question would be, uh, whereabouts do you live, Eric? I live in Petaluma, California. Right on. Born and raised here in Sonoma County. That's great. Uh, actually, I am also born and raised in Petaluma. I went. Oh, I was there till I was what 19. Then moved to Santa Rosa, and then Windsor, Healdsburg, and then back to Windsor. Sonoma County native. So far, all my life. At some point, I am moving to North Carolina, but that's another story. We're here to watch, check out your um, your adventures here. Um, so another another question I have for you, Eric. Uh, how much off road experience do you have? You know, in real vehicles, like big vehicles, very little, almost none. But I did talk my parents into buying me an off-road go-kart when I was about 11. And we lived in a private driveway where uh, I was able to kind of terrorize our little neighborhood there and explore a lot of off-roading type adventures that way. But but nothing in, nothing like I've done recently. Now, do you mean like go-kart like we're used to seeing where it's really low to the ground, little tires? Or do you mean something like a, a small size side-by-side? No, this is way before sides by sides were a thing. This is just a simple little Briggs and Stratton five horse go kart. It's got some big knobby tires in the rear to kind of give some suspension and little knobbies up front with little springs on the spindles. So it gives you a little cushioning, but it's pretty much a basic fun cart that's kind of meant for off road. And, and uh, that's, I still have it to this day. It's 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 a joy. But, uh, but, that's awesome. You know, Dylan, I've never asked you that question. What did you, what was your first off road experience of vehicle wise? Uh, Probably, I mean, I used to go four-wheeling and stuff when I was younger, so I guess if you consider that off-road, I mean, I used to go into the woods and whatnot. I'm from Indiana, so for me, it's, it's much different than uh, growing up uh, in Indiana than it is here in California. Um, but I guess that would be my first really off-road experience is taking some trails and stuff uh, with some four-wheelers growing up. But off-road vehicle as an adult, uh, actually, probably when I went to Mendocino, actually. <laughs> what were you driving? Uh, the uh, Jeep Wrangler. Oh, so okay, all right. No, that's a great way to start because it's kind of hard to get in trouble with the Jeep. <laughs> they're really, they're they're ready to go. I'll eat those roads up, um, Eric. So, what first planted the seed in your brain to? Or let let, let me back up a little bit. What vehicle did you drive off road? Year, make, model, uh, modifications, so on, so forth. Go for it. Okay, on this trip, I basically used what I had. You know, I mean, I want a nice truck, but I don't have anything like that yet. So I took the 240 Volvo that I had and uh, pretty much stock. It already sat a high, and that kind of inspired me to put on some all terrain tires, some uh, general grabbers, 27 inch by eight and a half by 14 inch rims, just the stock wheels. And uh, those are two inches taller, so they gave the car a one inch lift. And then I added a spacer in the rear of half inch for a little more lift. And uh, other than that, it's pretty much stock. I didn't do any other modifications for off-roading. 
I just uh, brought some extra gear to help me get unstuck if I did get stuck and crossed my fingers and was careful where I went and we've got went pretty smooth. We've got a picture of your car up now. So how exactly did you, what size tires are you running on this Volvo? They're 27 inch on a 14 inch rim. So they're the smallest all terrains that are available as far as I know. And uh, about, the, about the biggest I can fit on this car without cutting and really modifying big time. Okay. So did you make any modifications to this car? No, nope, not yet. I'm planning more. I'm going to add some belly protection, you know, thinking about making a front bumper and a winch and doing it up even more. But uh, meantime, I'm just going to keep running as is. I want to add some protection underneath so I don't have to worry about damaging anything at the right height I'm at. I ultimately want to maybe lift it one more inch, but I don't want to ruin his drivability, so I don't want to lift it super high. And, uh, and I already found at pick and pull a locking differential out of a newer Volvo that I will install later. But I uh, haven't seemed to need it too bad yet. I was quite surprised how well it did. And, and you know, I'm not so rushed to install that as I thought it'd be. So Volvo actually makes, or some of the Volvos come with a locking differential? The About 10 years newer than this car, like mid-90s, the 740s, 940s turbo models, they have a Eaton G80 locker that is the same thing they put in, like, new Chevys. It's, wow. uh, it's definitely not the best, but it's definitely great for the money. I paid 77 bucks for what I got at Pick and Pull and... You know, all right that price for for something um awesome. so did you put any lift or anything on this i mean you had to have done something just, else to this looks like you took just off a half girding. just a half inch in the rear and, and then the tires so would you else. blocks underneath the uh, rear axle between the spring and the axle it's got coil springs and i just you know used like this big thick round washer i had that was a half inch thick right. and bolted underneath the rear spring mount Wow. You make it sound so simple. simple. <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, I didn't want to go too far yet. You know, you go too far, then you need to relocate shock mounts. It just gets it complicates things when you go too far. So uh, just right right now, I'm keeping it simple and just being yeah. mild. And the tires tires alone lifted an inch. So and and the car sat high as is. The stock ride height seemed kind of high. And I'd, like, wow, this looks like it'll do okay. And I thought I'd scrape more than I did actually. I, it didn't scrape much. All right. Well, we're we're all three gearheads here. So, what kind of power plant you got under the hood? That is the original B two thirty F. It's just a two point three liter four cylinder. Um, pretty what? economical. Pretty, you know, not very powerful. It's only one hundred and fourteen horsepower. I think it's really a little bit gutless once you load it all with a bunch of stuff. And you're on the freeway and those tall tires, but it gets you down the road and it doesn't burn a lot of gas and so. Has it got what uh, a lot of us call a snail, otherwise known as a turbo? Not this one. I have another bowl that has a turbo that's probably twice the horsepower and a whole different beast to drive. You've but got two of these. I have two bowls, yes. Okay. This so is my latest one. Another one I've had for 20 years. Is it a part? the second one a parts car or your second uh, your second build? No, the, the other one I've had for 20 years, um, I bought it. Gosh, it used to be my adventure vehicle, and I've taken it to like six Burning Man, I've taken it to road trips to every neighboring state, I've used it for all kinds of things. But I fixed it up so nice that uh, with a new paint job and all, I was afraid to take it places I used to. And, uh, <laughs> so, like for the last year or so, I didn't go as many places. And then, and, and uh, this bowl I took wheeling, this is the one you see my two, the DL. Um, that one I found for cheap. I had some parts it needed. I was going to try to flip it quick and get rid of it and uh, make a few bucks on it. But once I started driving it, I'm like, I really need another wagon that I can use for hauling stuff around and not worry about the paint job on my other one. And mm, yeah. uh, it, I ended up keeping this and so Dylan, and I, the next. Dylan and I can definitely relate to the uh, keep it clean. We, we, we I think it's uh, safer. For, correct me if I'm wrong, Dylan, but uh, we both really have pride in our rides, but yet we do take them off road. Uh, we, uh, myself, I try my absolute hardest to stay out of the bushes. Um, but every once in a while something happens, it may be a pretty boy truck, but I'm still going to take it off and go play around. So is that true? Am I allowed to say that for you, Dylan? Sorry to. Oh, yeah, you no, no, you're, you're definitely accurate. I mean, I like to detail vehicles. So, you know, for me, I, I'm okay making it dirty because it gives me enjoyment cleaning it up too. Right? <laughs> and you're off. That's a spirit. From what I've uh, been hearing down the grapevine, a little mouse. At some point, you're starting a uh, some sort of detailing channel, right, Dylan? Correct. Correct. All right, and you're so gonna it, give it, 
in cool. Texas, I used to do a lot of detailing, like on higher end vehicles. So I used to do uh, uh, McLarens. I used to do uh, wow. a couple Lamborghinis. So I used to do some high end uh, vehicle detailing. Um, I did it mostly at a shop, and it, I did it for free. Basically, I actually worked at a shop because I wanted to get the experience. Um, and then I was going to start detailing out of my own uh, garage, basically, and and try to make a little bit of an extra income by also um, using YouTube as a little bit of a passive income as well. Um, so I'm still trying to get everything set up. I'm trying to plan out my my videos and whatnot, but it's it's coming eventually. Okay, and you're going to let us know when it does come, right? Correct, correct. Okay, good. Thank you, because I'm going to hold you accountable to that one. I got, <laughs> got it. Um, while I look at this hey, picture, Dylan, if you want, go ahead. Dylan, if you want to show a shot of my other Volvo, you can let people see what you know. I, I'm into clean cars too. It's see where why I got two nice and a. Did you send me that a, photo? I, I think I did. Yeah, of a dark silver, dark gray, sitting uh, at an airport. I sent it with the truck picture as well. Well, I got the tr the six by six. I have that, but I don't see another car. Shoot. So. Okay. Didn't make it. Yeah, I got it's 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 pretty fancy looking. It's all lowered, big wheels, fancy turbo. I usually okay. it's more car show than than backcountry. So I really enjoying having this beater after having my other one so nice and having to be really careful keeping it clean. That uh, taking this thing out in the woods, I didn't care at all if I scratched the sides. It was really nice. Not to worry about that. There is that. I just sold my '86 Toyota pickup that had rattle can paint, and that is one of the things that was I really miss about that truck was the fact that I didn't care. <laughs> The only downside mm -hmm. to me was I, I always felt a little like, is it going to make it? <laughs> I never felt as comfortable okay. driving it uh, as I do my newer vehicles. I don't know. Maybe it's a false sense of confidence. Maybe it's the warranty and the full coverage insurance. But uh, I, I, I like the fact of being able to go wherever I wanted. But the new reality for me is that I've got a uh, WR250 dirt bike. I can take that wherever I want to go. And I don't care if it, I've dumped it over a ton of times. So. The, the diesel truck gets me where I want to go with the bike and so thereabouts. Um, so um, let's see here. Let's go back over into uh, this one here. So um, it looks like we're current so far on the chat here. So at this so my point, buddy Nat uh, just commented. Just want to say, hey, uh, Nat, see, he just commented. And I saw my brother earlier. I want to shout out to Rusty. Yeah, please, by all means, give everybody a shout out. Uh, I, I'm glad that uh, Eric was able to share this with so many people and to get them to come in to hear this story because uh, it, to me, it's I can't wait to get it started. And I kind of feel like since there's not much else going on in the chat, which I am watching right now, uh, I think we should maybe get started on your story. What do you think? Sounds good. All right. Would you like me to start with the map or with a couple of pictures? What would you like me to start with? Um. Hmm. I well, I guess you could show the map, just get people an idea where I was starting, where I was kind of heading. And I mean, not everyone knows about uh, Bartlett Springs Road like you do, and and I've learned. So, do uh, you want to maybe sh just start with that kind of basic, or let's do picture? that. I don't know. Let's do that. And uh, remember, specificity is good because not everybody knows where these places are. So uh, don't mm -hmm. be afraid to be too specific. Uh, Dylan, if you happen to see something in the uh, chat, uh, please feel free to chime in. If you have a question that I or a statement that I have overlooked or not thought of, please add it in there. Uh, and at some point, maybe uh, Daniel said he's probably going to jump in here too, but we'll see. I'm not going to hold him to it. Um, so here we go. I'm going to go back to screen share. It's going to give me that awesome, uh, weird looking thing. Uh, stop. Uh, share screen here. Go here. And then we're going to go here. So I'll zoom yep. out. Here's your first pin. While you're doing this, I, I can tell. Well, maybe you want to start with Bartlett Springs Road if you want. Like th this is something I heard about many years ago when I was first wanting to get an off-road vehicle. I was just looking at what trails are around here, and Bartlett Springs Road was one of the first that came up because it's one of the easy roads, and I uh, figured a good thing to try. And, uh, and I was reading about the Indian Valley Reservoir, and I've got an inflatable kayak I love traveling with, so I really wanted to go out there for years, and it's been something I just haven't been able to do. I didn't have the vehicle. Never made it happen. So. A little. I, that was my plan. Just I wanted to head out Bartlett Springs Road and see that at first. I knew it was an easy road. That that's probably not what I was wanting, but that's where I wanted to start because I've been wanting to see it for too long. 
And, so, uh, and the more I learned about it, the more I got turned off about even going out to Indian Valley Reservoir. But luckily, off. when I did do my trip, it was off limits anyways because of COVID. Um, and mm. wasn't even an option. But I don't, I'm not, so I'm not too gung ho to go out there anytime soon. There, there is that. That's so yeah, I got close to it. So I, I took, you know, most of the length of Bartlett Springs Road just about until it became BLM land when you're just a few more miles from the Indian Valley Reservoir. And then, then I took that left on the on one of the backcountry roads, and that's where the journey started getting more interesting. So if I could add a little so, more specificity to this, um, yes, get to Bartlett Springs Road. I'm in Windsor, Sonoma, California, Sonoma County, California. We go up one. I go up 101. You could take 175 to the 29 and down to the 20, which is the way I went. Yep. Or, but that's an extremely windy road. The 175 really windy it is and you're limited to i think it's 40 feet of total vehicle length i took one down there that was 42 feet that i didn't know and whoa oh boy not much fun but normally i'll go up here to you pass ukiah and then down the 20 and head east to nice now once you get a little further east of nice that's when you start you're it's pretty obvious there's a little wire i could show satellite view uh barlow springs road it's once you've turned on it once, you'll never forget. There's this winery right here, it's a big patch. You turn in here. This is a great spot right here to pull over if you're caravanning. Let everybody air down their tires. Uh, make sure everybody's caught up and then head up further in. I'll switch back to map view because there's more specificity on the roads. So you basically handed in Bartlett Springs Road, which we'll zoom out some more. Ultimately, Bartlett Springs Road runs into Indian Valley Reservoir and then goes around uh and at some point in there it changes to walker ridge road um bartlett springs back in the late 1800s was actually a resort that you could stay at it was a hotel for an extra 25 cents a night you could get a room with a floor <laughs> i'm not kidding <laughs> um and then they rebuilt it um i think it was in like the 50s or 60s i could be completely wrong but mid 1900s um and it burned again so uh after that, they pretty much left it alone, and there was just the bottling facility and a gazebo and, like, a single-wide home there. Uh, and then a few years later, that burned also. Somewhere in my archives, I do have pictures of that, and I do actually have one of the original bottles um, of their bottling plant that says Bartlett Springs on it of uh, carbonated water. So you headed up there, and at some point along Bartlett Springs Road, you turned off of that. Where did you turn off? Well, if you can zoom in, try to find 303A. It's about a mile before Bartlett Springs Road becomes BLM land. And like it's that really hard turns back left. Right. Let's see here. That would be probably um, this. No, that's Bartlett Springs. So here. No, no, you were you're just right there. You're just right there. Right about. This yeah, is Bartlett Springs more. Road. This road goes down south. You want to go north. Right about the center there. What, are you sure it's not this one? Because this heads north. Oh. I don't think it says 303A though, Twin Valley, because this is all in, uh, BLM over in yes, here. Yes, that. Yes, that is the route. That's the road. See how that, like, very bottom of the screen there, it cuts. Yeah, if you zoom back in on that. Uh, tell me when. Um, zoom in a little more. And then up to the left, a little too far south. A little more, a little more, a little more. But a zoom, follow, go up the road, like away from the reservoir. Yeah. Okay. So away the intersection, from... a little more, a little more. That's the intersection. See right? Zoom in, zoom in. Right here, where my cursor is. Yes. This looks like it's about the turn you're talking about. Where it heads up towards what is it? Bear or something or other? Well, this road, I yeah, it does kind of head towards Bear Creek, and I thought I was trying to go straight through, but uh, it's really not well marked once you're out there. And I was kind of wandering and ended up way off track from where I was intending to go, because uh, I didn't really know where I was at. But that's the road, you know. It 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 gets a little rough right away, and this whole track going out this way is uh, definitely in kind of an end road. It's a lot of ruts and it's not a bad one, but it's it's definitely not an easy one where. Uh, it's a lot of private properties and I didn't see any camps. I drove quite a ways. I was surprised how few camps I saw for how much land I passed, but it is a lot of private properties. That mm -hmm. Yeah. There's, um, no, I don't finding that one that we can show later. 
but I'm uh, going to be completely honest. So, I yeah, it, it was quite a drive my first day. I don't have a whole lot of experience on this road, so that was another reason I'm so excited to hear about this. Um, but one of the reasons, another reason, additional reason why I wanted you to come on is to prove that um, – these N is in November, not M is in Mike, because there is a difference. M road, Mike, N November. Um, the N roads are, are are less maintained, and the fact that uh, er, or we were able to get a car back in there is just that's that's awesome. So if I keep zooming out, does that uh, where's the pin at? There it is. So you basically follow, just kept following this road up in there on huh? this Twin Valley Road. It's labeled as exactly yes, yeah. That is called. 301A, and then at some point, with my paper, it becomes uh, comes an end road, and it's not marked. I didn't know where I was at. I didn't, I didn't know have a map that would show me that I realized. And uh, once I was out there, I was just kind of stumbling along and hoping I'd see something that told me where I was at, and it never did. So you it's didn't have, at all. You didn't have a pre-planned route where it was like I'm going this way. This is it right here. This way. Turn right, well, my plan, my only plan was to go out Bartlett Springs Road, take a left on that 301 and find a camp. Hmm. Well, it looks like you did. So here's the first pin you gave me. We'll switch to satellite view. And we'll zoom in here. Got to love Google Earth. So what are we looking at right here? What is this right here? It's the first camp I found on that road. So uh, it was quite a long drive. It was actually getting late in the day. I got sort of a late start that day. And uh, it was getting probably 7 p.m. when I was there. So I find, I was glad to find a camp. And uh, But it was the first one I'd seen after a long drive. So I was quite surprised how little I found out there. Um, but once I found that spot, set up camp, you know, made myself home, I didn't see, you know, I didn't see anyone once I turned off Bartlett Springs Road, I saw no one the day before, and my whole morning there, I didn't see anyone until literally at noontime. I was loaded, ready to hit the road on day two, and the Jeep of some guys drove by that were clearly newbies, and uh, they're like, hey, you know how to find the Eel River from here? I'm thinking, oh, boy, you got a long ways from the Eel River. I know, <laughs> yeah. like, you're a long ways away, you know? Yeah, I, and, I, uh, I suppose you could get there from here, but... Uh... Yeah, it was you know, five guys in, in a in like a forerunner that uh, I don't think they had enough gas. I mean, that's that's quite an adventure. That is quite an adventure. So, and I could see I could see the guy going very slowly over some of the obstacles that I cruised right through, and he didn't see near something in his four by as I was in my car, and that was going to be extra slow. I figured, and I don't know how they good they did, but wished him luck. I'm sure they had a great day being out there, regardless. But I'd be surprised I made the Eel River. So uh, you had mentioned earlier um, some gear. What exactly did you bring? Did you bring a high lift, a shovel? Did you bring any sockets, open ended wrenches, uh, straps? I mean, did you? What did you bring? Yeah, since since I was by myself, I didn't want to go out there completely unprepared. Uh, I did pick up a high lift jack, since you can kind of use them as a hand winch if you're if you're really stuck. Yep. I already had a couple couple smaller straps. I bought another extra thirty foot strap. Um, so I had probably 70 feet of strap, and I had the high lift jack, and I also purchased a pair of uh, traction pads, and uh, as another option if I got stuck in mud or whatever. And uh, I did end up using the traction pads at one point, but no, I never really got stuck or really needed the gear. But it was nice knowing I had it if I did get myself over my head. And I knew I was probably gonna be out there on my own, so if I didn't have the ability to do it on my own, I, it was gonna be a little more adventure than I was hoping. So, uh, Eric, High Desert Drifters Overland uh, asks, was the campsite the Penny Pines Campground? No. I mean, I was nowhere near. This, this campsite here is nowhere near any other campsite as far as I know. There is one a little to the... Here you go. It's right here. North. There, there's, there's a campground to the northeast, but none of the roads connect to it. <laughs> um, I'm not near any, any organized <laughs> campgrounds. Can you guys see this yeah. thumbnail that just popped up when I hovered over Penny Pines Campground? It's like a house that fell in on itself. <laughs> it's <just> temporarily closed. <laughs> I think it's a little more than temporary, but okay. But it looks like that Penny the point, huh? Penny Pines Campground is a little bit nor uh, north and very much east or west. So what is that? West, west, north, I guess they'd call that. Forgive me. It's, I'm not real good with that kind of stuff. Um, Dylan, are you very familiar with this area? Have you been out uh, Indian Valley Reservoir or any of these roads? Is he still here? I don't see him connected right now. 
Oh, well, we must have lost him anyway. We'll keep going. So um, we got that one cozy here. So, yeah, no, I was pretty far from Penny Pines. I ended up kind of stumbling my way to Penny Pines the next day, but I I really was got lost there and ended up way off from where I was intending. And I realized later, I think it's because it was private property, and I was navigating by the Mendocino Forest map, mm -hmm. and it it – it shows the private properties, but it looks like the roads go right through. Now, if, do I understand correctly that the motor vehicle use maps do show the roads kind of blocked off when you hit a private property? Or do those, or how do you know when you can't get through because of private property? Does it look like on the Mendocino map I can get right through? And I learned later, no, it's private property blocking the whole section there that was my intended route initially you know that's a good question that we're going to have to cover in another uh in another live stream is what do you do when you approach some private property i actually went through a section two weeks ago uh, of private land but the gate was open so when I, I i drove through and i left the gate open my understanding is that uh the gates open or the gates closed just close it behind yourself um but we'll go yeah. into that one in a whole nother live stream um so are there any uh, pictures that are uh, connected with this stretch of road? Should I show a couple of pictures real quick here? Well, if you want to go back, there's not too many pictures I don't think I took coming up to here. So if you want to go back, the first picture I gave you was actually a beautiful campsite I found at the very top of uh, Bartlett Springs Road. That, well, this uh, is the first picture you, you saw. Probably have... Was this awesome looking thing here? That's Where'd... my dream Volvo. That's, Where'd you run into this? Next... This was for sale in Vacaville a couple of years ago, and a guy from Texas came and got it before I could get my money together. Oh. Uh, I've been looking for one for years. They're very rare, most mostly not in the States, uh, but it's ex-Swedish military Volvo. Portal axles, locking diffs. You know, they make a four-wheel version and these six-wheel versions, and they're amazingly capable and not terribly expensive. They're kind of about the size of a Pinsgauer, if you know what that is, which is smaller than a Unimog, um, but yeah, they're all very pretty kind of similar. And uh, this is this is when I, you know, have a real vehicle. I'm hoping it's something like this. And but in the meantime, I'm using my wagon. Okay. Well, yeah, that's the definitely a big difference between these two. But that looks like a lot of fun. Uh, probably not cheap yes. to drive though. Six by six. Well, it's only a three liter six cylinder. I hear you get people say twelve to fifteen miles per gallon, depending on how you drive it. You know, it's not great. Three it's not bad. liter. It's Three wow. liters. It's the same engine they put in the Volvo 164 sedan. My God. Um, yeah, you really I have a 70, <laughs> I, I've been into them for years. I, I, I bought one in 95. I still have it. It's a 71 142E that has a B20 two liter four cylinder, which is the <laughs> same engine as this three liter B30 that they put in these things. So I already kind of know the engine, just not a six cylinder version. And, Did you say but, this was diesel or gasoline? Gasoline. Wow, that seems, excuse me, well underpowered, but I guess gears are everything, right? Gears are everything. They have 125 horsepower, and I was blown away driving it, how powerful it felt. It, it really didn't, it didn't seem underpowered at all. It was, it, it's all about gearing. What do you think, Dylan? Would you rock this? I definitely would. I, I've, that thing's a beauty, and you're right, that those are rare. Uh, scoop those up whenever you can, for sure. Yeah, that broke awesome. my heart the most. What broke my heart the most here is that uh, for some reason, in last year or so, I hear the DMV will no longer register these here in California, even though they're most from '75, pre-smog, no issues like that. They no longer want to allow these uh, military vehicles here. But ones like this one that was here that was already registered, they grandfathered in and can stay. But if I pick another one up in another state, I I can't bring it here and register it now. Crazy. Wait, uh, X Country just said or six by six. Uh, are you saying what do you mean by that, X Country? Um, play it in South Dakota. Dakota. There you go. You know, a lot of the the, the train when I'm driving on the freeway, a lot of the uh, tractor trailers, their trailers are registered in Oklahoma. I don't know if you've noticed that, but apparently Oklahoma has the cheapest registration out there. Um, so, uh, how about we uh, scroll on to the next photo? What do you say? So we can kind of mix. Yeah, things yeah. So. Go ahead. Did you have a final the, the, this one? No. If you go, but if you want to, uh, there's a beautiful view from a hilltop that uh, was the first campsite I found, the very top of Bartlett Springs Road. You guys might have stopped there before. If you've driven Bartlett Springs Road, but you might have seen this. It's right off the road on the right, right this? near the summit. No, no. Um, 
Hmm. They're all numbered. I was going to kind of just go through them in, by number because I, I, it's hard for me to really know what photo you're talking about. Um, if that's okay, I'm just going to kind of load them and let you talk about them. Like, what is this? Yeah, they look like... You've got a burnt car. Is that, it? that, yeah, that's a, that's right at my first campsite. Now, when I was driving down that road, you know, it was getting tougher and tougher and I still had my front air dam on at that point and it kept smacking the ground. And, uh, this is where, where so the first day I got a late start and it's about 7 PM here. And I saw that burnt out car and the road wasn't getting any easier. And I saw that camp and I said, oh, let's take this as a sign to just camp here and, and, you know, make call tonight. So, uh, so I was correct when I noticed a couple photos ago when we first started this live stream that your front air dam that's right here, let's see if we can zoom in a little bit. Well, let me do that. Um, was actually up on the passenger side by the tire up on your roof rack after a while. So you took it off during the drive. Yes. Day one, I hit it so many times on the trail coming in on day one that I took it off the morning of day two and I'm never putting it back on. So you don't think it would have made a cool video to let it like drag by one bolt and then go rah, rip it off and you know? <laughs> <laughs> there's cooler there's different there's cool videos to make come on uh, I don't know yeah, no no I <laughs> I'd want to yeah, run no, the tire and have the tire yank it off but that's just me <laughs> stick a camera right underneath the the, the bumper there and <laughs> video the whole thing um, but that's just me and it's your car so I, I didn't want to destroy parts it's actually a still good air dam those are kind of hard to find with the tabs not broke on the sides and and they do serve a purpose. Yes. Uh, so this looks like it was another campsite, or which? No, this this is that campsite. This is that campsite, right? The car, that burned out car, is just kind of down behind my car here. And uh, this, I don't know what you call this area. I know I kind of went through the Twin Valleys, and uh, I really, I, like I said, I didn't know where I was until I found the pin on that map. And I don't even know what you call this. This is kind of seemed like out in the middle of nowhere. I hadn't seen any private properties near me and no evidence of any buildings anywhere near me out there no no there's not a whole lot of buildings out there there's a lot of this is a hot and dry section of the state it's not it's not the greatest it's fun to visit but i wouldn't want to live there um and i knew it'd probably be a bit bleak after the fires kind of burned out but part of me just wanted to see that you know i wanted to see Bartlett springs road and i knew this part of the forest burned a couple of years ago it wasn't gonna be the prettiest but part of me just wanted to see it yeah, this all got hit by the Mendocino Complex fire. Detected at the doorbell. Yep. <laughs> Somebody's pretty, pretty badly. I mean, all the big trees for a lot of this stretch was gone. So it's mostly just little green shrubage, shrub, you know, foliage on the ground. It happens. Um, if anybody's curious, I do have uh, for I, I got lucky enough that I did fly my drone before the complex fires. I have a video up and then I did fly it again after the complex fires. So you can kind of see a before and an after. Um, if you happen to uh, be curious about it, uh, check it out. I certainly can't cover the whole area because that was a massive fire. But it is taken from Hugh Springs, uh, both before and after the fire. So if you want to check that out, feel free. Um, let's scroll through a couple more pictures real quick, and then we'll go back to the map. Um, Dylan, anything to chime in? If I missed anything, I, I want to make sure you still feel like you're part of this whole thing. Yeah, no, no, I'm good. I'm just actually listening to the, the story. It sounds awesome. Yeah, I guess that's what I thought. Mm -hmm. Great. So uh, this looks like it's more of a view of the burn, but it gives you some idea of how much, I th let's just say a fraction of the uh, of an idea of how much burned in the complex fire. Um, you can see all the way back over to this faraway ridgeline, that's all burned. Um, mm -hmm. Tremendous amount of just flat out area gone. Um, it, not gone, but I saw... From what I saw, it looked like close to half of the whole lower portion of the forest burned, at least to it some did, degree. It hit one side of Indian Valley uh, Reservoir a lot harder than it did the other. But that valley uh, where it goes from uh, Bartlett Springs Road and it hits, um, I want to say after those few houses, so probably, I think it's about maybe five or ten miles before Hugh Springs is, everything on the uh let's see what side would that be the south side of the road gone you look up the ridge and you're like oh burn all the way to the top of the ridge i took my drone to the top of the ridge and looked down and looked back up and every ridge line thereafter it's all burned um i understand it's part of nature it's part of the cycle that's great um but uh it is what it is um so let's do another photo here uh so well, this is let me let me tell you real quick yeah 
this picture, what we're looking at here is actually the view from that campsite. That burnt out car is just out of shot to the right. And this is just kind of looking down the valley further up north, kind of the way I was playing, the way I was, the direction I was headed. So the next morning, that's kind of the direction I went. But that's just a view from the campsite. It's quite a pretty view, I thought. And... Yeah, they're all unique. Uh, anywhere you go in the National Mendocino National Forest or even the BLM, they're all unique. And uh, in my opinion, the different. Uh, how would I say this? Uh, BLM versus Mendocino National Forest. They're two different, uh, completely different terrains, completely different climates, um, different areas. Uh, uh, different things are more accepted. Uh, I find that it's a, there's a lot more OH, OHV is a lot more accepted out there. Going out there to go target shooting is a lot more accepted. The forest, uh, there's some OHV. Shooting is kind of, you know, it's loud, but it's not really done as much. You go out to Indian Valley Reservoir, and I don't want to say lawless by any stretch, but it's kind of that. <laughs> I've never, I think I've seen in the, what, 14 years I've been going there, I think I've seen the BLM Ranger twice. Uh, <laughs> wow. I've seen uh, fish and wildlife more than I've seen the Ranger. And even then, they, I mean, they came into camp and, we didn't have any fishing poles, but we had quite the armory sitting out, and they didn't care. They stuck around and chatted. Ended up running into them the next year, the same guy, one of the two guys at Pillsbury the next year, and then the next year I ran into the other guy on my way up to Pleasant Meadows. So they, for some reason, they remembered me. I don't know how. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so uh, let's see here. So the, another shot of your camp. Next shot. Yeah, this is so you keep the shovel ready because you need a shovel ready when you've got a fire going. You've got a little water sitting over here, although I think it's supposed to be a bucket. But we're not, I'm not going to hold you accountable to that one. Um, but yeah, shovel. I ready. didn't have a bucket. Is the gallon of water not 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 close enough to a bucket? No, I don't know. It's I'm just kind of giving you flack. <laughs> it no, doesn't matter. No. Well, I'm still learning. I mean, I felt like I was in compliance, but I don't know. Dylan, what was the time frame of this um, when you went out? I didn't catch the time frame. Was the time like frame. Uh, this was Memorial like Day weekend. Memorial Day weekend. I head out on a Friday. Got kind of late start, so I probably hit the road till about 1 p.m. and uh, and then I didn't come home till Monday evening. So just almost four days out there. Three nights, okay. four days. Yeah, awesome. maybe a month okay. ago it was. Yeah, that was a good yeah, question. Was, I, I completely yeah. missed. It. Dylan, so thank you. Because I, I see the fire, and I'm like, wait a second, because I, I want to go camping this weekend, and I want to have a fire, but I was like, everything seems to be on lockdown. So if you found a hidden gym, by all means, that's where I'm going. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, 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 obviously they've set restrictions. This is not allowed now, but I think I was still okay then because of the COVID, right, as far as I know. Oh, yeah, the COVID keeps the fire from spreading. Yeah. <laughs> it's the fire well, But at that time, I didn't see any restrictions for a fire like this. You know they didn't have they didn't hadn't stated yet about having to have the on off valve. Uh, it's um, ostrich theory. I can't see it. It's not there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know, but we're not going to get into the whether you were compliant. Okay. Uh, that's not what we're here okay. for. Um, one thing I noticed as I look through this is you brought some kind of blocks to level it out. Well, who likes to sleep in a car that's sitting on an angle? You know, I want I'm sleeping in my car just to save messing with the tent, and it felt like a safer place to sleep. But uh, yeah, I brought some blocks to level out the car, so it was nice and comfy. Yeah, I think uh, so. I've been going there for again. I don't really know how many years, but I'm going to say 14 years. I know I probably said a different number a few minutes ago. Um, I think we've seen two bear. Barry of Supermoto has been with me on most of my trips, so he can probably correct me if he's still watching um, as to how many we've seen. We caught one on camera. Um, there's not a whole lot though. For the most part, BLM is so busy with uh ohv and target shooting that most animals pretty much avoid the area to find the animals you got to go deeper into the end roads and stay away from uh, uh bartlett springs road and um walker ridge road and such like that you got to go deeper in there uh this used to be very popular for pig hunting uh before the fires um but i would give it a little bit longer but with this fresh growth everything's going to be coming back because all this fresh green stuff to be Oh, so he is still watching, and he says two bears in that time in that time frame. Um, a lot of deer are going to be coming back in because this fresh growth is nice, soft, tender greens that normally the deer and such wouldn't be able to eat because it's too tough or too high up. 
So this is going to become a great area to go hunting in. If you're looking for a spot, something to check out. Since 2006, that would be uh, about right. So thank you. I, I appreciate the comment there, uh, Faria Supermoto. Thank you for helping me with that one. Um, let's do another photo or two and then maybe go back to the map. Sure. So this is another view. Okay, we can see the car over here. This, yep. This would be the next morning um, as I'm packed up. Made sure camp was cleaner and I found it. You can see where oh. the burnt out car is in the background. What's um, this uh, orange thing right here on top next to the tire? What's that? <laughs> Your front air on dam. On my car? Yeah. That's my air dam. That's that's where it rode the rest of the trip. Okay. Exactly. I took it off that morning because I knew it was just getting in the way. In the, out of, uh, more out of the way up there than in the front. So uh, my understanding is you are a mechanic currently. Yes, Derek? I've been a mechanic for about 30 years. Okay. I have not been a mechanic for 30 years. I've maybe got 18 years experience. My understanding is at low speeds, the front air dam doesn't do much, but on freeway speeds, it does, it does help airflow through the radiator. Um, that's my understanding. Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yeah, it definitely changes airflow. I don't know how it helps or hurts. I've, I've heard these add stability, like on the freeway, especially crosswinds, but I haven't noticed much difference. So I thought I might dislike not have dislike it being off, but it, I haven't noticed an issue, and I'm like I said, I'm never putting it back on as far as I plan. So this is just oh, another view here of this camp campsite. You can see the road we came in on, and uh, and yeah, just just trying to give a little view. It's obviously a nice campsite. You could probably fit you know four or five cars, no problem. Number tents. It's all pretty level, and, but it was the only campsite I saw for quite a ways. So uh, if you are heading that way, trying to find a campsite, not a lot to pick from. That's but it's a good one, I thought. Thing because we call this dispersed camping for a reason. We do this to get away from everybody, uh, not to be near people. So uh, I, I would, in a sense, say that's a good thing that there's not many because it gives you the privacy I loved to it. shooting, which I did see what looked like a 1022 sitting on your chair. Um, so gotcha. it allows you to, to not bother anybody because they're not going to hear that so well. Um, but one thing I would add, if you haven't been here, that you can kind of see it from this perspective. It's fairly hot and dry down in here. You'll find in the winter it gets really cold, but in the summer it's really dusty and really dry. But again, if you're looking for a good spot for OHV or uh, uh, target shooting, not bad. Although I think this is National Forest. So I should probably correct myself. The BLM land, uh, that's a fun place to go riding. Um, yeah, I, I never went BLM land because at that point it was still off limits. I was only in the National Forest. Yeah, they, they shut it down after, what was that, uh, Easter weekend when everybody and their mom went up there? It was like a whole other city. Uh -huh. uh, so let's switch back to the map. Uh, so are we still on the same map? This is where you stayed where we were just looking, yes? This is the first this one. This is somewhere on that drive. I forget if it was day one or two there. That was... Well, this is the the next pin so, is further deeper into the woods, so yeah. I would imagine that's probably where you. So stay. This is the campsite we just saw a bunch of pictures of. You can almost I don't know if you can see the car burnt out right there, but that's no, where the burnt out car was. This was taken before the complex fire. Okay. So there's so, the yeah, car probably wasn't. There. Yeah, it wasn't there, and it looked like I could see this trail from across. You got a picture from like over, over in here that kind of looked across, and I think I saw this road in your photograph there. Yeah, like from the camp, you could see that road. That road looks like it hadn't been used in years, and it wasn't on any of my maps. I only found it here on Google Maps. It was not on the Mendocino National Forest map or the motor vehicle use map, so I had no clue where I was. There was nothing to indicate there. And there were, like, markers that the Forest Service, whoever puts down, might have been numbered, but they had been burned, and you couldn't read anymore what they said. Yeah, yeah fiberglass burns too well. Um, so what if mm -hmm. we switch over to the other pin? which looks like it's a little further away, give you some perspective. There's Clear Lake down well, here. Well, leave it, leave it about here right now. What I, what I did, I, I kind of continued on my route that day. I was trying to kind of head right up north. I didn't know where I was going. I was just following that road, the direction it was going. And things aren't well marked out there. And uh, just stumbling along, there's the route I wanted to go it just said private property, do not enter. So I followed the road that didn't say private property and it led me south 
for a long ways in a way I wasn't really intending. It was fine. I wasn't worried about where I was going. But once I figured out where I was, I was so far from where I was ending. I was like, how did this happen? And it was exactly that, that it was private property. Said, don't keep going that way. And I didn't. And But there was no marking. So I didn't know which road I was on or which road I was turning on to. And I did turn on to another end road and at some point and didn't, had no clue. And, uh, so uh, that's part of the fun of it. You just wander around and see where you end up. Eric, I got a question from a viewer. Uh, Nat's asking, did you have a locker installed for the trip? No, I've purchased a locker, but I have not installed it. I was kind of anxious to do it, thinking it would be really quite needed, but I didn't, and it didn't seem to need it too bad. So I'm not like jumping to do it, but I will. I'm definitely going to use it. I'd like to have one. You know, muddy conditions would probably warrant it more, but it was so dry when I was out there. I didn't uh, need it too bad. So you didn't have any major traction issues. You, for the most part, you did okay with your Volvo. Yes, I think the tires I bought and airing them down, and uh, it worked really well. I, I was okay. surprised how little wheel spin I had, and I went some places that I thought it would have struggled pretty hard. So you mentioned that you uh, that a lot of the signs were burned. You didn't really have a uh, directions from Google printed out. So did you hit any of these roads here at the dead end and have to turn around and come back down? I didn't even remember seeing those turnoffs. I was looking for some roads, knowing that they should be coming up at some point, but I don't remember seeing anything. I, it seemed like the same road with no other options where I ended up just about on French Ridge and over not far from the M1 before I realized where I was at. Hmm. So, uh, all right. I, I, I wanted maybe explore them, but I didn't even notice them. I don't, I don't know if I missed them or what. I don't know. Oh, did okay. Um, all right. So let's switch over to satellite view and see if we can see the show where you stayed. So did you stay under some trees? It looks like. Uh, the second night, I well, I never really stayed under trees. I kind of wanted to, because I knew with the fire, it's a little dangerous. Some of the stuff falling on you. Yeah. And well, this is the pin you sent well, me. Well, so, so my second day, like I said, the trail led me way off path from where I was intending to go. And uh, once I realized where I was at, well, I just kind of adjusted my route. And I was right near Penny Pines at that point. And Penny Pines is not far from the M10. And uh, for some reason, I just felt like, let's go that way. Actually, no. Well, my plan was to try to find the same road that I was planning to go north on that for some reason I ended up off it. Um, I was trying to find that same road and go back south. I wanted to maybe kind of do a loop and go back out the way I came in so I didn't get stuck on some other road trying to go out a route I didn't know. And uh, so, yeah, I ended up wandering that same day near Penny Pines and then onto the M10, which, especially the M1 at first, really tripped me out. It had been a day and a half there of, of end roads. The, the tougher dirt roads and to be on pavement on M1, even though it's the worst pavement ever, where it was like, whoa, I wasn't expecting this. Kind of <laughs> odd. And, uh, but luckily it was only a couple miles. I turned down M10, nice smooth dirt. You can take just about anything you want down that road. And uh, this was middle of the day Saturday, you know, I, and I, all the campsites I was finding were taken at this point. And I was starting to get worried, uh oh, how hard is it going to be to find my next campsite? Mm -hmm. And I ended up going. I found Bear Creek, I took a little swim, kind of hanging out there. And right near there is the road going south that I was trying to come in on north. And um, I tried taking that. And at some point, you can, you'll, we'll see the picture later where I found the road totally blocked by about eight big trees, completely blocking it, where no one's getting through without hours of work. I definitely, saw uh, one of the photos had, had to turn around. And that was. One of these has a big pile of logs. Oh, here it is. Is it this one? That yes, that's somewhere kind of near Penny Pines. They're doing a lot of cleanup around there, cutting down a lot of trees. Um, right on the, I don't think it was M1. It was like a, oh shoot, I need to find my list of the numbers. But that was uh like 1601, I think 16N01, which connects to M1 right near Penny Pines, and it was just a contrast to what I was seeing. You know these big ruthless machines for 
cutting the forest down. It's kind of wild seeing some of the equipment they have out there. And uh, yeah, and that looks like it's going to pick up some really big logs. Needed like with this, with the district. Yes, that was a big machine. Those tires are about as tall as I am to get perspective. I'm six one. That's about how tall those tires are. It's <laughs> a big machine. This one looks like it just chew your car and spit it out into little pieces. Not That's really. That's the kind of machine it can it can crawl up to a tree, grab a hold of that tree, cut it off at the ground, and then shear all the limbs off it and cut it in lengths to put on the trucks. All in one go. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet that's a cheap piece of machinery. You know. <laughs> so let's see what else we got. Let's scroll through some more of your photos and take a look. We look at this campsite. Um, this one's got kind of an overlook. That looks like it's Clear Lake down in there. But I don't recognize this as being Bartlett Springs Road. No, this is where I ended up. Um, I, as I wandered, I ended up on an area called French Ridge which was beautiful up here. Nice rolling hills, views of Clear Lake to the south. And uh, this is what kind of led me down to the M1. And hmm. I didn't know where I was headed. I was just kind of going the only direction that I could at that point because behind me was all private property or the way I went. So, so can, can I ask you, way. at any point, did you have second thoughts about this whole trip? Well, not enough to stop me. Certainly nervous. I was I was pretty nervous going into it because I didn't know if I was going to have troubles on these roads where I'd turn off Bartlett Springs Road in a couple of miles, have to turn back and go home and kind of abort my trip. I didn't know what I was going to get into. I didn't want to invite any friends on this trip and have it fail like that and kind of ruin the trip. So I wanted to go on my own and see what it's like before I drug anyone else out there and make sure we can actually go and do what I want with the vehicle I'm trying to do it in. And did you get to do uh, it? No, I never really, I never, yeah, yeah. You know, I never, I never once had to turn back because the limits of my car, only because of private property or the road being blocked. Every obstacle I tackled, I made it through and I gave me confidence to try more, but I didn't want to break my car. So I didn't want to be too gung ho. I oh, want to be able to drive it home still. Go big or go home, <laughs> man. What's, what's up? <laughs> I work on cars enough all week. I don't want to, I want to play on the weekend. Um, so let's see here. What else we got here? Um, I thought this one was fairly dramatic. Is that so? Oh, yeah, this when, when I, tr this was a road when I, when I, this is, this was an end road. I found trying to go back south on the road. I came in north and, uh, I first had to do a water crossing kind of near Bear Creek and then went up this road that was definitely the steepest, ruddest, most rutted thing I took the whole journey. And uh, no one had been up this in a while, come to find, because all the trees up top that were blocking this. So no wonder it was so bad. But, Eric, uh, I got to ask I, a person. I, if I saw this in pictures beforehand, I would have said, oh, I don't think my car can make it. I don't think I should try. But once I got out there and actually tried it, it made it pretty well. And I would try worse. Eric, I got to ask you a personal question. It looks like yes. you got out to go to the bathroom and then looked at this picture. When I got to snap a picture of this, look at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> nope, that's not me. Oops. It, it, it does look like that, doesn't it? Uh, slightly, yeah, just a little. Mm -hmm. Judging from the angle, yep. just thought I'd bring that up. Yep. You know. No, Dude. that wasn't me, though. Okay, I wouldn't hold it against you. I just wanted to add a little bit of uh, my crude attempt at some comedy here. As somebody who's not got a radio personality background, it's not quite so easy. So you had uh, mentioned some water crossings. We've got pictures of water crossings here. Well, uh, tell us about yes. this one. Now this one, this one scared me. Um, when I first saw this coming from the other direction, it's the pictures don't do it justice. It's actually probably about a four foot drop on both sides going down into about a foot deep of water. And mm -hmm. uh, I thought I would probably high side trying to go over the edge, getting down into it or really badly bottom out with my bumpers at the bottom. And uh, if I was by myself, I probably would have skipped this. But I, there was a couple guys that were jumping in the water there in a Toyota Land Cruiser or some kind of Toyota truck that uh, I was chatting with. They were being really cool. And once I was, you know, hit and hot about maybe going that way, they said, oh, give it a try. We got your back. If you get stuck, we'll help you get out. So I said, OK, I'll do it. And uh, knows my. Nose my car into it, cruise through it, and it climbed out quite easy. 
I thought for sure I would really struggle here or get stuck and need to get pulled out, but I, the wheels barely spun. The car didn't struggle hardly at all. It was quite a steep dip going in and out where uh, the bumpers actually dipped in the water going into the entrance and then coming out in the exit. Even though the bumpers were a couple feet off the ground, they got totally soaked because it was such a steep entry and exit. But so the car didn't define. I, but I, said I would not have done that if I didn't have the confidence those guys right near, you know, egging me on and, and help me out if I did have trouble. So, so thanks to those guys that they're around. I, I saw them again later before my second camp and they were, they were great guys. So you meet some cool people out there. Question and comment for you. Um, question is, do you have breathers on your axle? Do you have your distributor crap sealed? Do you have your air cleaner, like uh, snorkel or anything? Are you at all prepared for water crossings or, or such? I don't want to get the carpet inside my car wet, so I was not prepared at all. I don't think I got it wet, but I definitely, in most water crossings, at least the deeper ones, was probably foot deep, and it was tickling in my whole underbelly of the car, and might have got a little water in, but since I don't want to get it wet in the interior, I didn't prep at all for anything. So as far as I know, no, I have no breathers, or other than what the car came with, there's nothing special I've done to waterproofing. All right. Um yeah uh when i my last toyota i had i put uh remote breathers i ran some vacuum line up into the engine compartment and actually used jeep uh little one-way valves to keep uh they don't let stuff in they only let air in, uh they let air in and out but nothing else and that was how i kept my axles from getting contaminated with water um i was just curious about yours um i had a comment it's, that's smart to do but no i didn't prep i didn't so, prep that much the comment I had was, uh, again, I've said this a few times in the live streams, is um, it comes down to a lot of driver and a lot less uh, the vehicle. Uh, again, as we're proving right here, it's uh, mostly uh, driver, not necessarily the vehicle. There's not much lift on here. It's got some AT, so it's got better traction than a lot of vehicles. But uh, it's if you got some experience, you're going to get even the smallest little car into a lot of places. If you have no experience, doesn't matter if you're even in a Jeep, you're gonna have a problem. So um, start off small, work your way up. Don't 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 get intimidated and go down something big and gnarly, and don't let peer pressure get you involved. And the next thing you know, your car is you know you blow your differential or pop two tires. Or uh, my worst case scenario, we lost uh, had a guy snap a, uh, the the metal brake line off at the rear wheel cylinder up at the top of Whole Mountain. Yeah, that was a big ouch. We got him home. We ended up folding it over, heating it up in the fire, fold it over, pound it with a hammer, heat it up in the fire, fold it over, pound it with a hammer. We got him home with three brakes. Um, but point being, he was in a Jeep, uh, and it still had problems where uh, Eric here is showing us that even in his even older car than the Jeep I'm talking about, he made it. Um, you have another picture here of a creek crossing, Looks or a couple more. So it looks like you're, what, just – kind of dip in your front well, this, exactly the two pictures had contrast to how high the hood was above the water to now my bumper is in the water um yeah the pictures it's hard to tell it's hard to tell but like the other side of that creek it's about a four foot climb up to the flat on the other side of that creek and i'm dropping about a four foot you know drop off into the creek here um let's see here so x country is asking eric do you have any other Volvo guys that go out on these adventures with you? I've got a number of the Volvo friends. We got a great little club here in uh, Sonoma County called the SoCo Moose Pack that mm -hmm. got some great people. And there's a couple guys in the club there that uh, want to join me. But like I said, my first trip out, I didn't want to invite anyone because I didn't know if it was going to be quite a fail or I couldn't go near where I wanted and you really needed a four wheel drive. But so, these guys do also drive but, Volvos. But, Yes, yeah, I got quite a few Volvo friends, um, all kinds of Volvos. No one has a lifted one yet, as far as I know, but but uh, I don't think that would stop some of us. Um, so it handled the river crossings fairly well. There were no major issues. No, no, no problems. There. And and uh, from what I heard, some one guy I met at Bear Creek said that was the deepest water crossing on this stretch of M10. All right, and, uh, but but this 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 water crossing was right on the side of M10, right by the Bear Creek campground, and there was an equestrian camp right there. I'm almost right across the street from that equestrian camp right now. 
Okay. And this is the trail. This is the one that I tried taking going back south where I ran into all the trees that had fallen down. And this is after I found all the trees falling down and coming back through. So I first went through that water crossing, heading out of the photo, and now I'm coming back through it a second time because it was a dead end up there. So uh, for some sort of frame of reference here, a popular spot I like to go to is right in here. Uh, let's see here. It's roughly into here, but if we switch to satellite view, there's a creek crossing right here. I've done this one in my Subaru a couple of times. It's, as you can see, it's fairly wide, and it's it's deeper. Uh, granted, Subaru is all-wheel drive, awesome traction, but this is really steep right here, uh, and I had no issues with that. So cars can make these river crossings. It's just a matter of judgment. Um, you know, be careful because if you do get your ECU wet, it's done. <laughs> you're in you're in a world of hurt, but uh, it, it is possible. So uh, let me switch back to your pin over here. And then we'll go back to a couple more pictures. We'll go back to the map. Um, looking at it, it looks like you've crossed it. Now, is this one another creek crossing? This looks like a fairly substantial creek crossing here. This one's Bear Creek. Okay. This is the really this is a really nice swim hole from what from what uh, Daniel was saying. This is a really popular swim hole, like like just to the left of this photo. Mm -hmm. I saw quite a few people hanging out here the first time I came through. And then maybe an hour later, here I am going back through because I was finding all the camps up around Bear Creek and all this area filled, all these all the dispersed camps that were open. The, the actual campgrounds were not open. I was surprisingly seeing three or four people camping kind of on the edges of the campgrounds that I thought were closed. Mm -hmm. But uh, everything I was finding in this area was already taken. And this was Saturday afternoon. And uh, so I was kind of going back. I didn't want to get too far from the direction I went because I only had so much fuel. So here I am returning back the way I, I, I came from and just looking for Saturday night camp. Site. Didn't now, know where it was yet. this looks definitely wider. Was it any deeper? No, it's only about a foot deep still. But, yeah, this is definitely the biggest, widest. And from the, to the guys I was talking to in some Jeeps, they said this is the deepest, biggest water crossing on the M10. So you were running into other people. Did you get any flack from anybody? Any laughs? Any scoffs? Any like, oh my god, I got to take a picture of this? Not laughs, you know. The the cheap guys, they were more digging it. Like, cool man, they were, they were you know, they were, they were they were sitting there taking a swim when I came up and drove right through. And uh, they were no, they weren't. I don't think they were laughing at me so much as kind of just getting a kick out of seeing it. You know, it's not what you usually see. Hmm. Uh, Dylan, I would assume that you saw that and you would just be like, hell yeah, let's go. <laughs> that would be my thought when I see it. Yeah, I'd be like, eh, you know, I'd probably let someone else go first, you know, instead of testing the water, even if it's a Jeep or not. I, I, yeah, I'd, I'd be like, I don't know until I get into the water how deep it really is. <laughs> there is that. It someone... looked pretty clear that it was only about a foot, so I just went That's for it. good. That's good, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can see the bottom, and it's kind of like, yeah, no, whatever, but. You know, I, from where I'm from, we had flash floods all the time. And, um, you know, the river would raise up, and you wouldn't know if your vehicle could cross it or not. And it doesn't even look like it's that deep. But then all of a sudden, you just be going, and it just drops down. And, you know, what looks like a foot ends up being four feet, for example. It's It, it was crazy back home. But so for me, I'm super cautious around water just because of that. I've had so many experiences where I've seen so many vehicles get stopped and on this road that everyone takes every single day. And then whenever there's a, a quick rain for like an hour, all of a sudden, like you can't cross roads now. So now for me, anytime I go out, if it's water, I pretty much have to get my feet wet to figure out if it's something that's passable or not. <laughs> Smart. Better safe than sorry. Yeah. I was wearing my Teva sandals and I was jumping out and kind of scoping it before I drove it. Just, just to be sure. 12 inches seems like you're getting pretty close to that breather though on the axle yeah it was it was probably about the center of my tire axle line you know the center of the tires it, I, I did stop but this second time i i got about halfway through the creek and i wanted to kind of stop and see how deep i was in and i opened my door and it was actually up a couple inches my rocker a little deeper than i thought and I'm like oh i'm not sitting here i kept on rolling and so it i could have got water in somewhere i didn't want it so no yet my little bit of constructive criticism on that one is 
I don't stop in the water because that's when, if you're going to get water in your axles, your transmission, your transfer case, that's when it's going to happen. Uh, when you're sitting still, when you're going through it, they have a, uh, that little cap, like I was talking about, like on a Jeep, will generally keep most of the water out. Of course, there are times when you're so deep, you're, you're screwed anyway. But uh, if you come to a stop, that's when you got to be careful of water and sand getting in your differential. You get sand in your differential, and you don't got much time. <laughs> so, um, yeah. again, constructive criticism. But you made it. You had a good time. That's all that matters. But uh, I'm, I'm not necessarily constructive criticism against you, Eric, as much as informing watchers that are watching in case they decide to yep. do this. If they don't go, hey, we're parked. Let's get a great picture of our car in the middle of the river. Not necessarily the best picture to take. <laughs> like, it may look that's, cool, but that's kind of what I was thinking. That's what I learned. Yeah, I aborted that plan pretty quickly once I saw what I was sitting in. <laughs> so, is this camp so, night two? This is camp for night two. So, uh, I was I, I came across Bear Creek heading back on the M10, heading back west, kind of you know, yeah, basically heading west at this point. And uh, there was just some end roads nearby, and I turned down one of them. I'm not far from the M1 at this point, and uh, I turned down this end road, and I bumped into the same two guys that helped me, that encouraged me to do the water crossing earlier. And they're like, "Oh yeah, that's a great site just down below us here. No one's down there." So uh, that's where I went, and it was a cool site. Now I realized later this this campsite, I think this area the fire had come through and they haven't really cleared it out. And I know all around here the OHV trails are off limits right now due to the fire. They haven't made it safe enough. And I think this yeah. campsite, this area probably wasn't very safe in that sense either. Maybe it wasn't the smartest choice, but I didn't know better at the time and I'm learning. But, but uh, I don't have any issues, but there's a lot of trees you can see, you know, marked for for getting cut down and well, yeah, there's no one all around me here, and this is another serene campsite. That's part I'm of what far from all the... about, though. We're trying to teach and help educate each other to what is okay, what's not okay, where can you go, where can't you go, uh, so on and so forth. So um, by all means, let's. That, that, that's part of my motivation behind this is to make sure that we're all compliant because one bad apple can ruin the whole bunch. Um, so let's work together to, to not only find cool places to visit because we – it's a, a whole lot of land to cover. It was nine, 900 and something thousand acres in the Mendocino National yep. Forest alone. Um, for one person to cover that and share it all is, well, not impossible, but that's quite a task. So when I hear opportunities of other people that have been like Daniel likes the M3, um, you just did this adventure. I, I get all excited. And yes, please come on. Let's. I have not been down that. So you can help fill in that void and help me out. So yeah. Um, with that said, this looks like your uh, next campsite. I see a lot of greenery around it, so that's good. All the trees around you are burnt, so it looks like a fine place. Maybe a little bit of clearing with a rake, but a great spot for a fire. Yep, it was a it was a great campsite. I, I was lucky. This one is actually a little bit on a ridge. It's kind of hard to tell in the photo, but it had kind of nice views through the trees and nice breeze. I was fortunate it wasn't too windy. I was a little worried about being on a little bit of a ridge with breeze, but there was no issues there. And well, that's that's good because uh, I've mentioned that before in some of the streams of being on the ridge. The you can get like just destroyed by the wind in some cases. Um, I got a question for you. If I zoom in here, these look like motorcycle ramps. Um, on my roof rack, I, I I had some Thule bars for years, and I bought a motorcycle load ramp from Harbor Freight. It was like a hundred bucks, and uh -huh. used that as like the base, you know. And then I added the Harbor Freight, you know, basket on the back. I just okay. kind of built a some storage space. Trying I to thought maybe you were going to use these as like recovery, uh, the, the whatever they I forget what they're called, but those they're like sleds you shove under the tires that have uh, like uh, uh, soccer cleats on the bottom and then on the top too for the tires to grab. But I'd be a little concerned yeah. about buckling under a car, especially a Volvo. They're not light. I did buy a set of traction pads, basically what you're describing. I bought some ARB ones, really nice, high quality Australian, one of the best, but I wanted okay. gear that you could trust. And, uh, but no, the load ramps are attached way too well to my crossbars. It's my roof racks kind of permanent in that sense. It, I kind of built it strong. So I didn't worry about it breaking. I can put a lot of weight there. And so I just, you know, I used the load ramp. It was a 1500 pound capacity rated load ramp. I figured I'd be plenty strong enough to put whatever I want on the roof there. And, uh, 
was it my yeah. 20? So. 1,500 pounds? That's quite a bit. I'm actually uh, shocked. It, it, it kind of trifolds into like a third of the width. It's got hinges on it when you uh -huh. don't use it, and they rate 500 pounds per stretch. Oh, okay. All right. And it's all oh. aluminum, so I think the whole thing only weighed 30 pounds. It's not too heavy. And you just buy it and bolt it on and go. I'm going to build something nicer later, I think. But for now, it works. So this looks like it's the same campsite. Yes, this is camp two. Uh, yeah. Wait. Oh, yes, this is this is just the other direction. Same camp. Okay. It's it a little like, more set up there. Looks like I see two Bluetooth devices. You got stereo music going. I do. I'm listening to some tunes. Yeah, yeah. Sean, oh. that great root. Ruger 1022 rifle that I got to play with and kind of brought the security, but honestly, like you, like you've experienced, everyone you meet out there is so nice and there's no one threatening for, mm -hmm. in the areas I went. You know, no. I never felt well, turned it when off. I, when I bring a firearm, it's for it's for personal. I don't want to say pleasure, but pleasure. It's not for because I'm scared. <laughs> like, not I'm not scared of the bears. I'm not scared of the other people. It's just because I like to plink some rounds off. Um, looks like you use the blocks again to level your truck out or your car out. And um, so I did every night. Can I ask uh, if you've got two Bluetooth devices? Does uh, that mean you're an Android user? No, no, just that with those speakers that I have, you can pair up to 100 at one time playing all the same oh. music. But with two, you can get stereo and, and set them wherever you want. And I was not sure. I did not know uh, iPhone allowed you to connect to more than one device. That's awesome. Well, they're JBL. They connect to themselves, I think. I don't know. It's, but, you know, you kind of have it have to hit a special button on each one so they connect themselves too. And, Correct. Yeah, you can and, use them. JBLs, you can use them like a little ecosystem. So you can uh, strategically place them like around your house, for example, in four or five, six different locations. And whenever you start streaming from one device, you can have it streamed to all devices. JBLs wow. are awesome um, speakers to get for the price. Huh. I yeah, with 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 two, you can set them up stereo, but if you want, if you don't mind mono, you can do up to hundred together. That's a lot. So if you had a hundred different speakers, you can have yeah, or you and your buddies, whatever. Yeah, it is I a have lot. No, I have I, no idea. Um, so during this whole this whole adventure, did you bring a paper map or an app or anything, or did you just go out on a whim and just go? Well, COVID was still happening, and I couldn't. The radar stations were open. I tried to ask them, "Hey, could you leave one outside?" They said, "No, we can't do that." I don't know, whatever. Um, so I had no paper maps. I was thinking of ordering some online, but didn't really have enough time. Didn't get anything. I found out about an app called Avenza Maps. Yep, I'm and aware. Avenza Maps has. I downloaded the whole complete uh, Mendocino National Forest map, and also the whole complete motor vehicle use maps. And so I was using both of those two as my map out there. I wanted some paper backup, but I couldn't get it. So all I had was my phone, and it worked. And uh, it wasn't until towards the end that I realized that my Avenza maps was also had my – it was indicating my location by GPS. Mm -hmm. And even without your cell signal, you can be out there and actually tells you where you are on the map. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that until, like, my last day. And uh, it would have been nice to know earlier. I, I don't know if I – saw the dot and didn't trust it or why i didn't realize that that dot was telling me i was where i was at but but yeah it, the maps tell you where you're at even without a cell signal just through the gps feature which was great yeah very handy so there that's one of the things we've talked about that a couple times uh with daniel that they're uh the apps are really handy because they'll tell you right where you are versus on the uh paper maps excuse me you need to actually like you know figure out where you are uh, which can yep. take a little, be a little more time consuming if you're if you haven't been paying attention to the turns and what the last road you passed. Um, the only advantage, in my opinion, that the paper has over the uh, digital app is it never runs out of batteries. Uh, mine's mm -hmm. also water resistant. I've busted it out in the rain and it's never been an issue. So that's kind of a moot point though these days because a lot of the devices are becoming water resistant. My uh, Android is. I've submerged it two feet deep to take video and it. It does just fine. Um, <laughs> question for you, Eric. Uh, X Country asks, uh, rooftop tent would be a cool setup on a Volvo. What's your thoughts on that? That would be great. You want to buy it for me? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, <yeah. All> right. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I, I, I love the idea, but the thing also I love about my Volvo is I'm six foot one. I can fit inside the back of that car. When I lay that back flat, it lays totally flat, and I can close the back hatch and still fit in there, laying not stretched out, but comfy still. You know, I can still lay completely flat and fit in there. So it's kind of nice leaving some stuff on top of my car and making my bed inside the car and not having all that extra weight on top of my car in a tent. And then now I got to find somewhere to fit the spare that no longer fits where my spare used to and everything else I put on the roof. So I don't see a rooftop tent going on this car, but on the future, yeah, I kind of like the idea. I wouldn't mind having one. But so it's more of a matter jumping, of jumping at right now. More a matter of budget than anything else. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So but, that's, but again, on, on this car, I kind of like sleeping inside and keeping the junk on top. You know, okay. but if I did a rooftop tent, I would have to. Well, yeah, I just, just the way I'm doing it for now. I don't know. So this looks like pros and cons of rooftop tent. So I like the idea up. of being in a car. And, my problem with the roof, my only quandary with the rooftop tent is it's stuck on your car. If you want to go somewhere, it's got to go with you. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't mind putting one on top of my trailer if they made one that tall because I leave my trailer in camp. But at the same time, I use my trailer as my tent. So um, I'm still kind of discovering what works for me, what doesn't work for me. So again, it's good for it may uh, it's good for us to, to bounce ideas and opinions off each other to help uh, feed the, uh, the watchers of uh, you know this is a good idea, bad idea. Um, you know, just give them some food for thought, for lack of any other word. I'll just leave it at that. Um, so what do you got going on here? It looks like you're literally on an OHV trail. I see bikes. Well, this this is the same camp we're just looking at. This is just the next day. Oh, well, yeah. I'll just, the previous picture was just the same camp the next day, just about to head out. Again, I try to leave them cleaner than I find them. There's a bunch of shotgun shells in that campground. So see some mess, try to clean it up, make it prettier than I found it. And yeah, at the bottom of the hill, right around the corner from my camp, that, that end road ends at these... Uh, I don't know what you call them. They're the numbers. They're, they're OHV trails. Yes. And uh, so, yeah, I took a picture of this. You know, I got my off-road go-kart that needs some work, but I'd love to ring it out here someday and explore some of these trails. Your so, off-road go-kart would make – you could make these trails yeah. in that go-kart? I could, yep. It seems mm -hmm. pretty capable for what it is. It's got a torque drive converter that kind of gives it gearing, and once I know how to use it, I can climb some really steep hills and go pretty tough places. That, yeah. And it's five horsepower? Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. All right. Uh, moving along. So it looks like more tree, and they're really doing some tree work. That's a whole nother machine. I'm not seeing the picture yet. Yeah, this is again, this is up uh, probably near the M1 or the end road that led to it and uh, kind of near Penny Pines again. So there, mm -hmm. there, there's the fire had come through, and that's kind of the area they're working on. All the trails, OHV trails coming in that area are off limits right now because they haven't cleaned them up yet, and this is kind of in that area that they're working on. And see, I'm not a biologist, so I don't really know the, the, the benefits, the advantages, and the disadvantages of doing what they're doing here. But to me, that seems like it's good building material. To me, I'd rather see them cut down these burnt trees and turn them into lumber than to cut down live trees and turn them into lumber. Um, but I know that when you remove the trees, you're removing a uh, home for insects and uh, squirrels and birds and all kinds of stuff. Um, so I'm not really sure how that whole thing balances out. But uh, for, uh, I guess, in my uneducated opinion, it seems like a great idea to harvest those trees versus, uh, like, again, the live trees that are, you know, off above this piece of machinery. Um some of the Why stacks not? of trees I saw looked like they were harvesting for wood, per, you know, for lumber reasons, but not sure. Well, I certainly hope they're not piling them up to clear or to do a brush burn, but hey, it is what it is. Uh, it's not my job. I'm not an eco uh, ecologist or whatever it is, so I was just making a comment there. Um, I think a lot of it, they're just trying to knock down the ones that are, you know, teetering, that are dangerous. And, no, we, and we don't make it safe for the public again. Yeah. Um, I didn't realize how dangerous some of that is until I learned later, you know, like burnt out stumps and logs and rocks that are loose in the soil that can come tumble anytime. And there's a lot more hazards in the burnt out forest than I realized. Yeah, I know. Sometimes I wish I could sign a disclaimer and say I'll take my own risk, but it is what it is. And I don't want to be that guy. So um, <laughs> what is this we're looking at here? 
Now, Camp Night 3, I ended up going back to a camp I found on day two that was a beautiful view up on a ridge, which I think was uh, near uh, French Ridge. And I'm heading back that way. So maybe I'm probably around, I might have just come off the M1 here, kind of near Penny Pines. And I'm heading back up, up the hill or up on the ridge. Um, maybe I should pull up this I third. Wasn't finding many dispersed, I wasn't finding many dispersed campsites around here. And uh, but I knew where there was one that I'd seen you know, the days before, and I was hoping it wasn't taken, so I headed that way, and luckily it wasn't. This third pin you sent me right. looks like it's at the end of 17 November 43 Road. <laughs> I've never seen that. The RV that, that, that was the that was the campsite we were looking at a moment ago. That like I said, the bottom of that road ends into a couple of the OHV trails. Um, so yeah, that's not far from Penny Pines, is it? Right next to it, almost. Yeah, I go back to this view. Yeah, uh, Penny Pines is just uh, southwest. Just, yeah, yeah. Or just so this is the out. one we. This is the same campsite we just looked at a few pictures of. Okay, all right. Um, so we're still current on the chat. So let's go back to some of the pictures. Um, so another question I have for you though is. Uh, did you what did you bring for like uh the proverbial band-aids and fire extinguishers like did you bring a two-way radio in case you got stuck so you could like try and call for help did you bring a first aid kit like what'd you bring i don't own a radio so no i didn't didn't have that i had my cell phone and on the ridge you know up on french ridge and some of the spots i had great reception but most of the time i did not so i figured it was on my own and try to be prepared with my, the gear I had. Brought a lot of tools just in case. I brought a few extra spare parts for my car just in case. I uh, brought, like I said, the traction pads and the high lift jack. And uh, but no, I I tried to enable myself if I got stuck, knowing that I was probably on my own, or if I could call help, it was going to be a while to get there, or tough to find me. Or no, I have to be more prepared for the future. But I didn't have that at the time, and I. What kind of uh, spare parts did you bring? Well, I had a, I had a mass airflow sensor that I knew my car was getting a little iffy and I hadn't put it in, so I brought that. I had a couple other spares from my other Volvo, just some random bits, ignition parts, wiring parts, just things I've collected through the years that I carry in my other Volvo on some road trips that I threw in with this one. And, uh, and then I carry a bunch of extra fluids. Yes, I brought a fire extinguisher. Um, Definitely had a shovel, an axe, a hatchet that kind of, or a machete, sorry, that has kind of a saw on the other side. Mm -hmm. And uh, just some things to work with. I didn't want to be completely unrepaired. Prepared. I didn't feel that well prepared, but I felt like I had a chance if, if I got in too much trouble. Uh, one second here, guys. Uh, um. So uh, I wanted you, to get you know, of you know the old saying you, you, you go out for adventure, but hopefully not finding too much adventure. You know, <laughs> I was I was okay with having some difficulties, but I didn't want terrible difficulties. So it, it it you know it was a little challenging. Like that first day, you know, banging the air dam a bunch. I didn't know how far I was gonna be able to go, and just went with the flow, and luckily got to go where I wanted. But it was a little nervous, and there were times that I was. Wasn't certain whether I was going to turn around and or like, ooh, even just up ahead. If I do have to turn around, how am I going to be able to do that here? But so if I might, got to take risks in life. And yeah, no venture. Well. Yeah, no risk, no reward. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Um, if I may sidetrack from this conversation real quick, if you look over on this map, you see Fout Springs. Um, you'll also notice in the chat we have X Country Adventures joining us. He has a really cool video of a ride he did at Fout Springs. Amazing job telling the story and uh, placing cameras where he rides by them. Uh, excellent. It's uh, I think he launched it in 2018. I just I, I've been following him for quite a while, and I just happened to stumble across that one. It's, it's uh, really well done. I really had a good time watching that one. So uh, shout out to you, X Country. Uh, I definitely would check out his videos. That one in particular got me because I'm into dirt bikes. Um, but a lot of his other videos are great also. But Fout Springs, uh, at some point, I'm hoping to make it there and go riding myself. Uh, so 
let's get off that soapbox and let's get back into the story here. Um, uh, you're welcome, X Country. You do make some pretty cool stuff. So um, happy to be a part of that. So uh, pictures, well, we got a whole bunch open here. Let's close a few of those and then we'll open up something new. Go back into here. Uh, where did we leave off? We left off on, this is one we have not seen here. So here's quite a view. And is that Snow Mountain over in the distance or what is that? Do you know? Um, this is looking sort of north, east. Okay. Yeah, it probably is looking towards Snow Mountain. I don't know exactly where Snow Mountain is, but that I know about where they, that range is. And that's kind of the direction this is looking. Yeah, okay, it's the direction, but that's definitely not Whole Mountain. Um, but as no, uh, as no Whole Mountain was quite a ways from me still. Yeah, and it's also got kind of a real good peak to it. It's pretty easy to spot. But it looks to me, if you look in this photograph, you got some burn over in here, not so much, but all of this across here, all burnt. So in this picture here, you can kind of get, again, just a little fraction of an idea of how much area burned in that fire. We had two fires start that merged together to form the complex fire to make one big mm -hmm. massive fire. Yeah, it sure was. It was huge uh, and scary. I think it's one of the biggest ever. I think it's one of the biggest ever. Uh, I, I square square, square I would, miles. You're probably very. You're probably right. Uh, <laughs> when I go down into uh, the M6 into the game refuge. It really gives you a whole, another perspective of how much area burned, and that's really far from uh, Hugh Springs that we were just talking about, which is uh, still even further away from where the fire originated. It covered a whole lot of ground. I, I'd have to look it up, but it, it's a phenomenal amount of area burned. Um, so moving along. Um, now, again, we've got even more. You can see this fresh greenery shining through the trees, but yeah, you're yeah this is looking west. You could almost see the ocean maybe if you got lucky, but this is kind of looking west um, from a similar point like we were just looking at. It's I forget the name of the – this is hmm, – yeah, some of the names, but it's pretty out there. I enjoyed it. You can guess. No, that we, we, don't, we don't want to guess. Um, so this Volvo really uh, got tested, it looks like. I mean, you don't have a whole lot of clearance between if I zoom in here and look at the spacing between your uh, fenders and your tires. You don't got a whole lot of articulation. Nope, I don't. And actually, it did upgrade the sway bars to extra stiff aftermarket sway bars just to make the on-road driving better. That certainly doesn't help the off-road. <laughs> no, not at all. And I did, I did have a problem on day one and I think day three where one of the bushings, the chassis bushing of the sway bar popped loose. Right? Sway bars are rattling, but it was pretty okay. easy to get down there, undo the brackets, slip the bushing in place, and fix it. Um, but Yeah, uh, yeah it's, it definitely hurts your articulation having a stiff uh, sway bar. Um, that would be one instance where you're going to end up on three wheels at one point or another, no, no issue. Or, I mean, uh, guaranteed. Um, but again, it comes down to the driver. It's you know, if the driver knows what they're doing, they can work with those with uh, three wheels on the ground. Um, as long as you got at least three, you're all right. Um, you don't certainly don't want no wheels. Rubber side down is the saying I like to go by. Um, but man, you really got to see some uh, vistas, even if it is burnt. It's still pretty cool to see. Yes. Uh, and the fact that I th you, I think this, I think this is 17 and 16. Or 17N04. Okay. Those are some you, of the ones I took coming back. Did you take notes on which ones you actually did go on? Not on the trip, but once I came back, I kind of looked over the map. Especially after you asked me to share about it, I kind of reviewed where I went. and So, so after this, at some it. point, could you actually like email me or uh, DM me on Facebook some of the end roads, and I could put them in the, in the uh, description? Yeah. I can do okay, that. Cool. Not that we're in a huge rush, but I'm sure a few people would like to see exactly where uh, we're talking about here. Um, yep. So this looks like it's the actually. The, well, anyway. This looks Go like on. it's another view of the same parking space. Yes, it is exactly. Car didn't move, just a different view, same place. And that looks like Clear Lake off in the distance. Yeah. No, Clear Lake is probably. To my left, pretty hard. Oh, that one is through lake. Yes, yes. Yeah, I was gonna say that's awfully round. It's not uh, Indian Valley, that's for sure. 
I guess it no, could be Clear Lake. Lake but... No, not enough hills to be Pillsbury. To me, that looks like Clear Lake. I see some what looks like buildings in the background there. So yeah, oh yeah, there we go. So this There's is this is where I'm heading back up towards French Ridge, and I think this mm -hmm. is French Ridge. Does that show up 17. on the map? French Ridge Tree Cross. Is sixteen N O one. Oh, 16 N01. This is 16 N01, I think. Okay, well, I don't have a link to that, and there's a whole lot. Yeah, of, yeah, yeah. So we'll just go yeah. with that's the one you're talking about, and I'll put it into the comments yeah. later. But from that spot there, I mean, from this pin anyway, Clear Lake's a long way off. Pillsbury's closer. Mm -hmm. Whole mountain. I couldn't see Pillsbury there. ever, but yeah. It you is, never, isn't it? You, you never got a chance to actually see it on your trip? Pillsbury, not this trip. I didn't notice it. Okay. If I did, I didn't notice it. Gotcha. Um, let's go back into uh, here then. Let's see what else you got to see. A little closer. Another little panorama. Where's your car? I couldn't get put car in every shot. Somebody stole it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That, that so is somewhere similar. Just trying to get panorama. Yep. So you got the, the pictures don't do it justice, you know. You got the overview of the lake. Uh, looks like the 1022 is one of the first things out of the car again. Mm hmm Well, yeah, I kind of wanted to like when I get to a campsite, I'd shoot off a few rounds, just kind of announce to the uh, bears or whoever that hey, <laughs> here, stay away. <laughs> I didn't realize how scared they are of humans. You know, that really they're not that not too much to worry about. But I just wanted to be safe. So. Um, I've done some backpacking in in Yosemite and like Lost Coast, where you have to bring a bear container and keep all your stuff away from your camp in your bear container, and so I know so there can be issues. But I, with that yeah. said, uh, my experience and my opinion, I'll make that the opinion very clear. Um, uh, the bear, all the wildlife is hunted pretty heavily out here in California. Our hunting lands are not as abundant as in some other states. So generally speaking, when you see uh, wildlife of any kind, except for maybe a, a doe who is not hunted, they don't want anything to do with us. Uh, they're not going to come into camp. I may be naive, but I don't lock my food. I don't hang it from a tree. Um, they, 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 they're hunted, so they're scared of us, um, which is kind of sad. Now, when you go down into the game refuge uh, off the M6, what I was just talking about, that's another story. Um, you're staying where they're not hunted. So I might be have some reservation about leaving food out, but I have stayed there at least twice, and I have not had any issues with them coming into camp. So uh, for those of you that are new to dispersed camping, um, it's not a bad idea to fire off a couple rounds. But again, the last couple of trips I've been on, I didn't even bring a firearm at all. And I did not hang my food from a tree. I did not hang my trash from a tree. And I did not have any problems with it whatsoever. And I'm not saying that that's not ever going to happen to somebody. But in my experience, in the, the, the 30 something plus years of camping out in the Mendocino National Forest, I have yet to have something come into camp, uh, except for a doe, uh, a fawn, uh, maybe some squirrels. That's about it. So um, for those that are new and dispersed camping, don't be too worried about it here. Maybe when you go up into Tahoe where there's more bears, um, yeah. or El Dorado where they're not hunted as much. Um, that could be more of an issue and definitely something to pay attention to. Um, so, uh, you got, uh, we're being asked by Overland trail guides. Do you guys use Gaia GPS or other GPS tracking app? I am speaking for myself personally, don't currently use one, but I do plan to, uh, let's see. Daniel Dempsey has been on several of our Overland family men. He's been on several live streams here, and he swears by Gaia GPS. Uh, I have a couple of friends that swear by X, on X Hunt. Um, the difference that I understand, and I'm not very well versed on all these different versions that are out there. Um, uh, X Country, or not X Country, um, <laughs> the name's mixed up. On X Hunt um, allows you to expand and upload your maps to Garmin's and whatnot, and it's more expensive, but it offers you more features. Uh, but a lot of people that I've been hearing lately say that Gaia is really good. I don't personally own a Garmin, so I'm probably going to go with Gaia GPS, but that's just my personal opinion. But you had also, Eric, mentioned another one. Which one did you use? 
Avenza. Avenza, Avenza okay. Maps. It, okay. it was just an app that uh, that downloads maps and has them save your phone. And like I said, it, it, it showed on the map a beacon of where I was at through the GPS, even without a signal. But so it, it, I, was, it didn't track or anything. So uh, X Country is mentioning uh, View Ranger app. I wish I could get you to come on and talk to us about that one. I'm a little curious about that. What's a buddy beacon? I've never heard of a buddy beacon. Is that like uh, your buddy's over here and gives you a pin so you can send it to them and then they know how to come find you? Uh, I'd really be curious about that one. Um, yeah. Guys, so uh, Overland Trail Guides also says, Guy has a ton of different layers, including 2016 uh, USF layer. Forgive me, is the, the screen's kind of far away. It's not quite so easy for me to read. From what, what's a USF layer? Uh, US Forest Service. Okay. Um, it would be my guess. It would be USFS, uh, but uh, that's, that's my guess. Yeah, there it is. USF, the next comment he made. So, yeah, US yep, Forest Service. Um, X Country saying he uses his Venda as, as Venza as well. Um, so, see, this is the kind of information that are the. One of the things I love about these live streams, we get enough people in here, we can get some real diversity and get some real diverse opinions about what people are using, how they're using them, what they're enjoying, not enjoying. Um, and we can work with each other to help, uh, you know, give reviews uh, and get a better idea what to use. Um, so thank you all for chiming in and please keep it going. X Country, I would still like to know what uh, the Buddy Beacon is. So if you would at some point toss that in there, I'd be grateful. Um, Eric, is there anything you want to mention about this uh, campsite? Did you like it, not like it? I mean, I loved it. This campsite I saw on day two. This is up on French Ridge, the way I was, I kind of stumbled upon this. This is about where I realized that I'm way off track from where I was wanting to go. And uh, I found this site and just pulled in, and it was kind of warm that day. And there was such a nice, cool breeze up on this ridge and in the shade of these trees. And, uh, but that day I wanted to go a lot further. So the first time I found it, I passed on it and kept going. Um, but then, uh, after, you know, then my last night I'm looking for another campsite and I knew I kind of want to go back the way I came in. This is one of the only ones I remember seeing. And I took the risk of heading back and hoping no one was already there. And luckily I got back there. No one was there. I got a pretty early start that day. Didn't drive too far. So it was only about two in the afternoon when I got here and it was still kind of warm, but it was so nice under the shade of these trees with some breeze coming over the ridge. Took a nice nap in the back of my car. And then uh, you can see the fire pit was kind of a, a mess when I got there and I rebuilt it and made it better than it was and just uh, made it my home for the night. But this was my favorite night of the favorite camp of the three, just because of the views and the beautiful breeze and the shade and it would have been a horrible campsite if it was really windy, but the, my, yeah. the weather I experienced was nice and mellow. And Well, fortunately, this one's a little bit back from the bluff, so it's not going to be as brutal as it could be. Um, forgive me. It would have been. It, it's not It's not protected at all. If, if it was really windy, it would have been ripping through there, I think. Uh, I'm taking a couple of notes here real quick. Um and then uh, the second one was okay. We can get to that later. Um, so another question: Did you mark the GPS location of these campsites? Or this one here? I think you did. I know you did the first one. The second one looked like it was in the trees, and then you got this one here. I, I tried to. I couldn't. I couldn't see on the map exactly where it was because it's all trees. I I think I saw where it was, but you can't tell for sure because it's not exposed enough on satellite view to see this spot exactly but i knew i was really close with that pin i sent you okay all right yeah uh because these are great um uh, so speaking of pins thursday night is where's your pin so we're going to be trying to share some of eric's locations some of uh, a couple i got a couple more spots to share um if anybody is watching has cool spots that they're willing to share with us uh, i would uh encourage you to join us thursday at 8 p.m on that show because that's that show is dedicated to new locations whether it be place to camp a uh, place to swim uh, an epic view um, a trail that you really must drive any of that kind of stuff where's your pin uh please join us uh thursday night at 8 p.m that would be great uh the other plug i would give is please if you're enjoying this thumbs up means a tremendous amount to me these comments that are within the string fantastic 
Uh, once we're done, uh, another comment is great within the actual video. Uh, if you're enjoying this, please subscribe. Uh, I'm not compensated. I'm not sponsored. Uh, I'm not monetized on YouTube. I do this, uh, everything that I'm using right now, I paid for out of my own pocket. Um, I do this on my own time, my own dime. I don't make any money at this, but I thoroughly enjoy camping. I enjoy sharing the experience with others. So those little things like leaving a comment, a thumbs up, and please subscribe, those mean a lot to me. It, it, it keeps me, uh, gives me some more motivation to keep this stuff going, keeps me happy, shows me that people are watching and enjoying this stuff. Um, so I wanted to read a comment here real quick. X Country says, Buddy Beacon, you can give someone your code that, uh, that's part of your group or someone at home. If you have cell service, they can see where you, where they are at, at their last location on the map uh, if you lose service. So with that said, that's a great idea or concept because hypothetically, what if you don't check in the next day? They know where you were, and that gives you a gen gives them a general vicinity of where to go looking. Um, I've mentioned before in my live streams that when I go out, uh, I always have a, a Google document with the uh, picture of the vehicle I'm driving, the license plate, um, and then where I plan to camp, uh, the frequency that my radio is tuned tuned into, um, and when I anticipate being back. And if I'm not back by this particular time, please send out the troops and come looking for me. Uh, I've mentioned it before. It's really easy to do. Uh, put in a description of yourself, the others that are with you. I'm 6'1", uh, 180 pounds, blonde hair, blue eyes. Uh, truck is a 2014 Chevy, license plate number. So if something does happen and you don't check in, the, it's really easy for a family member to give that to search and rescue or a ranger or a sheriff and say, here you go. Here's everything you need to go find them. Good luck. And your odds of being found if something happens, like your, your map sensor goes out and you can't drive, but you're physically okay, you're going to get found. Um, because eventually, no matter how much extra water and food you bring, it's going to run out. Um, so uh, throw those little tidbits in there. Uh, we had a couple of more comments come through. Um, but maybe I'm going to load the next page and uh, our next picture and I'm going to let you talk a little bit more, Eric, and I'm going to read through these and see what else we want to comment on. But this is great. Please keep the comments coming. It's great. So tell us about did, this did I, campsite, just look a different way. This, uh, that's, yeah, that's a little bit to the south. That's kind of the direction I came in. We're almost probably looking towards uh, Indian Valley Reservoir from that same campsite we were just looking at. So this is just looking to the left from, you know, Clear Lake would be to the right out of shot here. And that's looking back towards Bartlett Springs Road, the way I came in. Um, Probably the, some of the farthest stuff you see there is about where we came in, too. It seems pretty far, or at least over that, what the hills we see here. Uh, uh, so a question, Overland Trail Guides, what kind of meetup exactly is this? Is it just like a meet and greet at a brewery, or...? What not, but please. Hey, I have a quick question. Am I, am I gathering here Dylan Riggs and Overland Trail Guides are both Overland Bound members? Because I think what we're talking about is an Overland Bound meetup. Correct. Wow. Yeah, Overland Bound. Okay. And Eric, is that what you just introduced me to the other day? That's it. I'm a new oh. member myself, and I, I guess Dylan is, and Overland. Uh, Man, I'm off my God, I better get off my backside and get on there. Um, what I see in this picture is it also shows uh, another, it gives you almost a better perception of like, look how much burned. <laughs> everything. Everything. Yep, pretty much everything in that photo. And again, this is a tiny fraction, but you can see this is a big amount of area right here. Doesn't matter. This was just a tiny fraction. I can't imagine what it must have been like when that fire came raging through there that wide. I mean, I don't know how wide this front was, but it must have been massive and just, man, scary, 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 yes. scary. Uh, X Country is asking you, Eric, do you have another trip planned in the near future for Mendocino National Forest? Not exactly planned, but yes, got some in the works as soon as we can here. Um, yeah, don't know exactly what yet, but for sure. Summertime's here. I want to enjoy the weather. It's time to do it. Yeah, it's a great time of year. And actually, uh, the Mendocino National Forest, a lot of the end roads are actually in really good condition. 
Uh, there's a lot of car camping you could do up in the Mendocino National Forest. There's a whole lot. I have even see guys see guys drive uh, big trucks and towing like 20, 30 foot toy haulers up into there. Uh, granted, not every single road, some of them, but there are places if you want to uh, get into, you can get a Prius into some places. I've seen that too. I wouldn't want to sleep in one of those though. I'm uh, I'm only six feet, but no thanks. <laughs> I don't even want to sleep in my full size Chevy. I'm just that kind of person. Um, bye, Paprika. Yeah, also, when I was driving, oh, when I was driving past Penny Pines. When I was driving past Penny Pines, I saw you know some Priuses and newer Civics that are very low riding that were no problem. You know, for cars that wouldn't take in the back roads as well. That had no problem getting there because it's easy access. So, certainly out there. It's not really far out there. Uh, um, so I'm trying to take notes because there's all this information coming through that I have uh, never heard of before. This uh, Buddy Beacon and the uh, Ropo Meetup and so on and so forth. So forgive me as I'm kind of silent here in the background, but it's all good information. And this is epic because this is exactly what I'm looking for is to learn together. Um, is that the last photo? Oh, I closed it. Didn't mean to close it. No, that's not the last photo. Where do we leave off? The photos definitely got skipped around. And uh, there we go. Definitely was some. There you go. Yeah, we were not at the end. I just the arrow disappeared or something. Um, so this looks like a, is this the same campsite? It just looks like you're chilling in bed. That's where I took my nap in the afternoon. Yep. It's so nice, and relaxing, right. cool breeze, shade of the trees. Yeah, I can think of worse places to take a nap. So when it comes to gear, uh, did you bring an air bed or a foam mattress? Uh, what got, I, yeah, I've got a pretty nice uh, inflatable mattress that I used, about a three-inch thick, you know, that definitely yeah, made it comfy in the back of the car. That's We, we have a three-inch foam mattress that we uh, that we go camping with also. That brick is actually my wife, by the way, guys. So. <laughs> uh, <laughs> The we that's what we use for our padding. Uh, a sleeping bag or a bunch of blankets? What kind of guy are you? I brought, yeah, like I, it, the, the sleeping pad I was on is Exped brand. Really nice stuff that uh, di, uh, down in the middle, so well insulated. And I brought a zero degree sleeping bag I've got just in case it got cold, but it was warm enough that I had brought a couple blankets too, and I was fine under the blankets. If I was cold enough, I would have slipped in the bag, but it wasn't wasn't too bad where I was fine under just some blankets. No. In, in a car when it's kind of sealed up, I mean, my wind has cracked a little, but the car sealed it up that the winds don't chill you too bad. You know, it's not like being in a tent. So it's pretty warm in there as is. And That's the nice fine. part about car camping. If it starts to rain, you roll the windows up. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if it gets too cold, you can roll the windows up. The only downside is you need some airflow because you're in such a small little box that you're breathing. Every time you breathe out, you're letting out some moisture. Next thing you know, you wake up and your windows have fogged up and there's like, you know, uh, droplets rolling down your windows. <laughs> when a ranger pulls up, like, uh oh, there's a couple in there. <laughs> uh, so fire rings, uh, this somewhat this, staff, looks like you're about to start a fire in this one. I am. I probably spent a half an hour kind of rebuilding that thing. It was in shambles when I got there and there was a big rock pile just like 20 feet away. So I had tons of bits to work with so i rebuilt it made it kind of nice too bad no one get to use it this summer but that's all right it it'll, it'll get used next winter um one of the nice parts about here is that it's uh uh this this area is it it's it's lower in elevation so you doesn't get quiet you don't get the snow coverage you would like higher up on uh, near like say pleskett meadows or um that area where you're going to get snow actually when we were there two weeks ago we were not at Pleasant Meadows, but nearby, it snowed a uh, hundred feet above where we were at, and we were 20, 30 minute drive from Pleasant Meadows, and it's what June, but it snowed. Um, fortunately, we were prepared, so it was all good there. Um, so, hey, Eric, quick shout out, quick, sh quick shout out to my boss Jim at Alpha Man. Hey, Jim. Yeah, you, we better go. Yeah, I was about he to, wants uh, to go next time. Otherwise, I took the day off comment on that one so that's your boss yep that's alpha man that's him oh alpha man alpha man so do you know jeff zell <laughs> uh genuine he, motors he must have jeff jeff at general motors a couple doors down he's got to know him i mean jim's been there in that neighborhood for quite a few years so 
Yeah. Uh, most of the neighbors. Jim, my truck was at Genuine Motors today. Uh, and uh, when I spoke with Jeff, when he said he was on his way back, um, he actually meant he actually know uh, had seen Eric's car. So he was like, "Is it a brown uh, 240DL?" And I'm like, "Yeah, Mudtro or all terrain tires? Yeah. Oh, I know that guy. He works over at uh, Alpha Man. So um, nice to meet you. <laughs> um, anyway, so let's move oh, on. Right. Oh, once again, man, right, sitting right there in the chair. Uh, yeah. That's a nice picture of the flames, though. That turned out really well. It was so nice having real real fires out there. I've been camping quite a while and around a real proper campfire. That was wonderful. Nice and clean. Of course, you... Making the s'mores. And... So that... you're, what are you using for a stove? Is this a fuel can for your stove right here, this red thing? Yes, I did... Uh... I did. I do have a little camp stove that I was using for cooking when I wanted to, and that is what pro that fueled it. A little okay. snow peak, I think it is. It screws on top of that. Pretty simple, little lightweight one. It's more a backpacking thing that works for now. I'd like to get a better stove for car camping, but it traveled easy. Yeah, well, I, I that's just the old-fashioned two. Uh, I think I have a Camp Chef Triton. I think I can't remember which one I had, but it's a three-burner propane stove, and it's pretty compact, not too heavy. Um, I mean, for me, space is a premium in my Jeep. So if it's fine and it has three burners on it, so it's, it's pretty awesome. Um, but yeah, I also, I like to try to go backpacking as well. And I actually have the, the small little solo stoves too, and, uh, wouldn't go anywhere without it. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The small ones are great. My only complaint is that when you get really high up in elevation, it takes a long time to boil water. You don't quite have the same BTUs. Isn't that the problem with any stove at elevation, though? I mean, is it really going to be that much worse, a little one versus a normal camp stove? It's even no, like no. a home kitchen is worse. They'll still so work. Yeah. They'll just take longer to boil water. You start getting up into six, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand feet, it will take longer to boil water. Um, I have the advantage that I drive a huge diesel truck, so I bring a very big stove, so I don't worry about it, but. Um, Again, I get the what works for you with the car. Dylan works with the Jeep. Uh, it's your style. What works for you is great. Uh, we're just offering different opinions uh, from different perspectives, and that's what that's why I like having these um, multiple people on at one time is the different perspectives. It's it's great. Um, did you have any more comments to add to that, Dylan? About what's your what's your opinion of these stoves? Do you have you go up and you were up in El Dorado not long ago? Did you have any trouble boiling water with a little stove? No, the elevation wasn't as high uh, as I was in Mendocino, um, went going up Hull Mountain. But um, I, I think we only use the uh, the stove once. I prefer camping like with 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 an actual fire. I prefer to do everything on an open fire. Um, but like I said, moving out here to California, it's I guess during the summertime, it's it's hard to find those locations where you can do that. Um, so I'll be kicking out the, the stove much more often uh, or trying to, you know, maybe circumvent the, the fire rules a little bit. If it's like, oh, you can't have any open flame, but you can have a propane, then maybe I'll just get like a little stove or something that is like an open fire and, and cook on top of that. I don't know. I'm trying to you know figure out what I want to do. But like I said, space is a premium. So I'm just rocking that stove for now. Absolutely. So let me add to that, though. You do need a fire permit to have a camp stove. Uh, you should bring a rake and clear around the area just in case you hypothetically spill your bacon grease and it catches on fire. Just so everyone's aware of that one, uh, I can throw the link into getting a campfire permit in there, no problem. There are some campgrounds that year round you can't have a fire, but then you're not the first camping, you're staying in a campground. So uh, it's kind of that, well, do I want the fire? Yeah. Or do I want the, you know, that's where we're at. We, we have family coming in. My, uh, my wife's brother is, is flying in actually tomorrow. And this is going to be his first time out in California and, in, in a, a very long time since they were very little. Um, my wife's a military brat, so she's moved around quite a bit. She was out uh, around Vandenberg air force base, um, many years ago. And he was probably maybe six or seven years old. I can't remember. And the first thing he wants to do is go camping. And it's like, okay, great. But his camping is probably going to be like an open fire. And it's like, 
no man, that's that's not a thing right here anymore. <laughs> not during the summer months. So we got to mm-hmm. find that spot or, you know, suck it up and maybe have to sleep next to someone that's 20 feet away because the campgrounds are, you know, all, yeah, it's just double-edged sword. I mean, it has its pros, it has its cons. Um, me being in the military and with COVID, I'm allowed to travel right now 300 miles. And we thought about maybe trying to go to the Redwoods. We thought about trying to go somewhere um, uh, within that 300-mile radius where it, we can stay in a campground. I, I don't know yet. We're, we're trying to figure out what we want to do. I prefer dispersed camping, but, you know, I'm going to take what the, the family wants to do the most. And if they want to have a fire, then um, we we'll probably won't go disperse this weekend. 300 miles. That's uh, quite a trek. Yeah. And unfortunately I can't get to Las Vegas and I can't get to Los Angeles. Those are just shy of 300 mile mark. So if we uh, wanted to go to Disneyland, for example, or it's, it's off limits. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. Um, so X country says go West Crockett, go, go to West Crockett. Don't, I don't know if you saw that in the comments, Dylan. Yeah. I'm going to Google that right now, actually. That's what I'm doing here. You know, I'm, I'm trying to plan out the trip right now, actually, while we're on this live stream, trying to figure out where I want to go. And and if I go nice. somewhere with a fire in a, in a camp area, then I'm going to, uh, you know, try to go to an area that I probably won't be able to visit back in a while. Mm-hmm. Um, or I'll try to just, you know, look at some dispersed areas, too. But West Crockett, I'm going to write that down. Um, X Country does a lot of videos, a lot of very some diverse, all oh, from magnet fishing to the riding the side by side in the dunes, and then uh, like I said, Fountain Springs. But guy knows his stuff when it comes to the Mendocino National Forest, that's for sure. Never steered me wrong. Um, so with that said, while Dylan's looking up that, when you find that, let's we'll come back because I'm curious about this West Crockett. So I'm gonna go back and share a few more pictures and let Eric talk about those, and then we'll switch back over to Dylan. Hopefully, he can find some information on that if that's all right with you, Dylan. Yeah, yeah I'm actually looking at it right now. So it looks like Troy had with three tables, firings, and a vault toilet. So can you I pull up uh, things I don't understand? Would it be would, it has firing? So would fires be allowed? Can you? Uh, I, we can come back. Yeah, sorry, sorry. No, 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 no. I was going to ask you to share your screen. Oh, uh, I, I'm pulling up on my my desktop, so I don't have it on oh. here. Um, but I I can pull it up real quick. Well, if you uh, load up your uh, direct message I sent you, you should be able to open it up in both, and I can always add you as another screen. And X Country says yes. Uh, near Bowery Flat. So it looks like you might have found a spot you could actually have fire. So okay. am I correct, X Country, that if he went to West Crockett, he could have a fire? And is that a campground or dispersed camping? Uh, yes, campfires are okay at West Crockett with a campfire permit. That must be a campground. I thought it was only campgrounds that are allowing fires at the moment. Uh, yeah, that's kind of what I thought too. Yeah. For the most part, but then there's also the wilderness area, which I find kind of strange because that would seem to me to have a huge amount of fuel to burn. Um, but that's only if you find like a metal fire ring. No, nah, no, nah, it has to be in a designated. Uh, I forget the wording. Uh, the designated area, but that basically, if you go to the Mendocino National Forest website and you look under campgrounds, uh, those are designated spots to have a fire so you can go in there and you could have a fire they're already set up and apparently they they, they manage the forest to keep it clean and also make uh i guess they have some sort of fire breaks so that if something does happen they're slightly prepared for it if that makes sense um but yes you can find that yeah so, so looking at the the fire restriction orders it, it looks like it's almost copy paste no matter what national forest you're looking at because i was looking into el dorado uh, Stanislaus, Mendocino, and when pulling up the, um, the, the fire restrictions, it looked almost verbatim. And any, all of them seem to be, if you went to a wilderness area, you could technically have a fire. And maybe it's because it is for backpacking. You are going to have like a stove or whatever. Some people may need to start a fire for whatever reason because you're, you know, safety. I don't know. But they seem to be a little bit more open with the, the wilderness stuff. And I think also it's because it's such there's just not nearly as many people that are going out to those areas that there are going to just, you know, off of a trail, for example. Um, you pretty much have to be, uh, you know, 
hiking in or whatever a few miles and um yeah. you know maybe it's just lower restrictions i guess i don't know but they all seem to be pretty much verbatim on no matter what like forest you're looking at yeah i've noticed that too um i think i might have found it on the map i can pull i can share my screen and then uh x country should be able to tell me if that's what he's talking about or at least or dylan um let's see here if i go add the stream and go here this is West Crockett Trailhead, though, but I'm seeing West Crockett or Crockett Peak. Um, so I, X Country is, I don't know if this is the, the the area you're talking about or not, but uh, that's what I was able to find when I typed in West Crockett. Yeah, I see West Crockett Trailhead. Area status is open. Yeah, a lot is open now. They've opened up a whole lot of the forest. Um, there's only what, like mm -hmm. half dozen campgrounds that are still closed. There's more closed from the fire areas. They haven't cleared up than uh, COVID reasons anymore. Yeah, mo they've opened most of them back up other than fire reasons. Okay, so uh, he just replied, Trailhead has a small area for camping, two rings. So in theory, let's see where you see, because you come in from like the five and then somehow get in there. That's, that looks like it's within your 300 mile range. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm good on the mileage. Now, as of like last week, it was 150 miles. So I was very limited to where I can go because it's, mm -hmm. it's a straight shot, 150 miles. So, you know, if I went through all these side route roads to do it or whatever, you know, it would be okay. Um, so it's a little bit longer than 150 miles, but I think it's just a radius, just a circle or whatever. And it's 100, 150 miles was the limit I could go. And now it's 300, not good enough to get to like, like I said, Las Vegas, not good enough to get to like, you know, Los Angeles if I want to do any type of city type stuff, but camping wise, I mean, it gets me pretty much everywhere I want to go. I'm not sure if it gets me to Yosemite or not, but we would be interested to go to Yosemite. That's, that's something that's on my bucket list while I'm here in California. Um, I definitely want to head out that way, and but I don't know about the reservations and stuff. We want to do something kind of low key, you know, easy to get to. Um, but yeah, it, it should be a, a fun experience. Um, I preferred like El Dorado when I was there over Mendocino for my first trip. Um, I really enjoyed Mendocino, but El Dorado, I think it had a little bit more uh, eye candy. I mean, as far as seeing the mountains and, and things like that, the hillsides and stuff. Um, it, it was definitely a little bit, uh, a better review. And my, my wife, she handled the trip in El Dorado a little bit better. She has a little bit of anxiety depending on elevation and seeing like, you know, if you were to drive off the road, I mean, how far would you go down type stuff? She gets a little bit of the anxiety and stuff. Mendocino going up Palm Mountain, she didn't do, she didn't do very well. So for her, she probably wanted to do something a little bit easier and stuff too. But, um, if this place is pretty easy to get to, then we'll probably consider going to there this weekend. This, I mean, it's hard to tell from oh. Google Earth. I'm pulling up uh, the satellite view, and it doesn't look all that steep. Because yeah. I think you, that's one of the things your wife doesn't like is looking over the cliff edge. Correct, correct. Granted, it's really hard to tell from this view if it's actually like a cliff edge or not. But Yeah, I mean, if um, you're surrounded by trees and stuff, she, she'll be okay with it. It's the open view. And we didn't know she – she was like this until we uh, we moved here. We stopped at the Grand Canyon and uh, just driving through some of the, the hills and stuff, getting to the Grand Canyon itself. I mean, she just, yeah, she almost had a panic attack in the car. It was not fun. <laughs> but, you know, it's, yeah, it, it's, uh, it, it was an eye opener. So what we try to do is, you know, try to go to areas that's a little bit easier on her. For me, I'll go do whatever, I, you know, whatever I want. I'm okay with anything. But, you know, her... Uh, we got to be a little bit more cautious, I guess. Make sure she's not passing out in the Jeep and slamming her head on the window <laughs> or something. Oh, God, that'd be terrible. That would be absolutely terrible. Um, this looks like it. I forget what thumbnail I made, but this looks pretty similar to the picture I think I used for the thumbnail for uh, this live stream. Now, you used one of me trying to cross Bear Creek. Oh, that's right. Yeah, this actually, this was the first one I tried. Um, but I didn't want the gun in the thumbnail. 
Um, I didn't want some anti-gun person to be like, oh, I'm not tuning in. There's a gun there. The guns are not the premise of this show, but when I mean, we're out in the woods, it's kind of, you know a lot of people carry them. You go to some of these. I gather most most people do. I was definitely hearing some rounds pop off in the distance every day. I didn't see many people, but you could hear them, hear their firearms. Yeah, uh, and there's places you'll go like I, you guys that follow me pretty well regularly. I mention this place all the time, Pleasant Meadows. I've been there a few times, and pretty much everybody there uh, has a sidearm exposed. That it's not concealed carry, it's exposed carry. But to me, I don't mind. I don't. I'm comfortable around guns. I don't mind. If somebody's walking down the city street with you know an AR over their pack. Yeah, I might have some problem with that one. But out in the woods, I don't care. Go ahead, have a good old time. Just be careful about where you know what's beyond what's beyond or behind your target. Um, but yeah, this is um, um, this is a good photo. You did good a good job on this one. But you Thank definitely you. Like, broke, broke necks. Thanks. You definitely like to show off the twenty-two. That's for sure. <laughs> um, it's the first time I've had one out to play with. I've, I've I don't own any guns, and my buddy Sean lent me that, and uh, I've never taken a gun on my own and done everything on my own. I've always been there with the owners of the gun and them kind of overseeing it and shooting with them. They're, this is just me on my own with the gun my buddy lent me. So it was right fun. on. I, they're, that's a really Look good. To get my own. I I own a 1022. I think they're awesome. They're fantastic. This 22 rounds are inexpensive and just kind of fun to plink around. One of my my new favorite, uh, which I uh, one of my new favorite activities, which I wouldn't do right now because of the fire danger, is actually take shot shell and place the primer uh, facing you and try and shoot the primer with a 22. And if you hit the primer with a 22, the shot shell explodes. So it's very gratifying when you actually hit it because it goes boom and hits it. It's kind of fun. <laughs> Uh, but you 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 have to pretty much place the size of the the bullet is the a 22 is about the size of the primer on a uh, 12 gauge shot shell, so you got to hit it pretty dead on. But when you do, it's it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, you know, yeah, time and a place for firearms for sure, absolutely. Um, now in this place is there's not times for it, but in the most part, I I'll carry them pretty much every time. Uh, but not every single time because I'm again I'm not scared of wildlife I'm not scared of the people I just enjoy shooting so when I ask myself I'm going to bring one it's more of do I want to shoot one or not shoot one it's not the weight it's not being scared of bears or people so um, that's kind of a cool shot looking down and for we're also seeing some burn but not as much burn it looks like looks like it kind of thinned out in through here the, these two shots you just showed could almost be a panorama. That's the left and look to the right where you saw. You could almost see Clear Lake. But this is kind of the direction out of the back of my car we were seeing other photos of. Clear Lake's there. You can see it. Okay. Yeah, a little bit. Yep. Just a little what, bit. Yep. What is this? Looks like a, as a drone operator, it almost looks like you're being spied on. What's that? What is that? You see this? Can you see that? Yeah. Maybe a jet in the background? Airliner, maybe? It's awfully know. weird to be a jet because this looks like the fuselage and a wing, but you'd think you'd see it. I don't know. It's just a little weird. I'm trying to figure out huh. what that is, but it's got to be some kind of aircraft. I mean, that's a massive drone if it is a drone, but that's what I always think of because I am a Part 107 certified drone operator. Yeah, UFO, right? It's a UFO. <laughs> then an unidentified flying object. It's a small unmanned aerial vehicle. Uh, small UAS. Weird. Yeah, I, that is definitely something that I, man, I wish I had a, a crisper picture to figure out what that was. Um, so, I mean, this I see your air dam. looks like high lift. What is that, a piece of two-by-two two you've got hanging off the side of your car? What um, what are you seeing? Um, I do have a long piece of wood. I brought a piece of like one by one. I was thinking of maybe kind of using it as a uh, cantilever and maybe use okay. a tarp I have as some shade, but I never end up touching it. All right. Just, oh, you got some sort of wet. Is that a wet one sack? by one wood? Is this a wet? Yes, sack? it was oh, leaking. Didn't work. It didn't work. Oh, on top, yeah, it's a dry bag. I do a bit of hiking too, so that's a dry bag. And I figured I could put some stuff on my roof, and it it would stay dry and clean, and no worries. But didn't need to leave it up there, but that is a nice dry bag. 
Gotcha. And you got quite the I pillow. Did, I did. I did. I. Some of, some of the wood I brought, I did bring, uh, I brought the wood to help level my car, but I also brought some extra wood in case I got stuck. I had some other things jam under the jack or whatever I needed mm -hmm. to do to help get me unstuck. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's got kind of a dual purpose. I brought all the chunks of wood. Give yeah, I brought a couple big pillows and a bunch of extra blankets. I want to be really comfy, you know. I'm trying to enjoy my vacation, so. You know, the way I look at it. Plenty of room for comfort. I, I only want it more comfortable as I get younger and younger. I, I can't sleep on rocks anymore. Um, maybe back in my, you know, when I was 13 or something, but now I hey, want to, yeah, younger and younger, more and more comfortable. We already saw that picture. I think we saw some of those pictures. Where are we at here? You got another crossing. Here's you soaking in the water. Oh, that's not that deep. So that's a whole nother great crossing, huh? Looks like some good paint scratching. Uh, back. Yes. Yes. Yeah, this is uh, this is the 30301 that's heading back towards Bartlett Springs Road. So this is kind of towards the end of my trip where I'm almost back to Bartlett Springs Road and going through that stretch back there, Twin Valleys and such. There was a number of creek crossings, probably five or six, and uh, it was getting kind of warm. So it was nice to just stop and splash in the water and cool off a little bit. And yeah, I definitely scratched the sides of my cars a bit, but I wasn't worried about it. I wasn't trying to not do it. You probably could have been more careful than I was and, and not hurt your fancy paint, but I definitely yep. added some new stripes to my car on this trip. Quite Stri a few. Yeah, speed, uh, what do they call it? Speed stripes make you go faster. Well, I've, I've heard them called cowboy pinstripes. Oh, there you go. That's a good one. I haven't heard that before. I like that one. So I gave my car custom pinstripes that weekend. There you go. It's okay. We've got a guy that's about to start a channel on how to remove those if you get one in paint that you do care about. You know it. I got another one that's so fancy, it's a pain in the butt. So uh, no, I don't care about this paint. Uh, small compact. Sorry, I'm, I'm reading but, some of the comments trying to keep up with stuff. Yeah, uh, you'll have to show me that uh, that vehicle sometime. I'd like to take a look at it. So is it in like pristine condition to paint and everything or? I had it repainted a couple of years ago, so it looks beautiful. Yes, it, although it has almost half a million miles. I've had it for 20 years and it has 455,000 miles on it. Okay. What? So it, 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 455,000 yes. original head gasket? No, I, I changed the engine a while ago. I didn't need to, but I found a really low mileage engine. And so the engine in it only had maybe 150,000 miles on it. Good thing you know a guy. The car. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been one of my labors of love over the years, keeping that thing happy and slowly but surely upgrading it. It definitely drives better and looks better than it ever did. So, now, did you put any one projection of my favorite on that? toys uh, on your uh, on the repaint? Did you uh, like ceramic coat it? Did you did you do anything kind of protection for it? I did. I did do some paint protection film on the front. A buddy of mine has been doing that for a lot of years, and uh, okay. he custom did the front of my car with some paint protection film. Cool. Yeah, I've heard of that. Nothing else. I, I was curious about the ceramic coatings. I might do that, but there's pros and cons there too. I just haven't bothered going too far yet. It's been yeah, that they have. That's kind own. of something that I almost say I specialize in it, but it's one of the things I do. I don't do paint protection film, but ceramic coatings, that type of stuff, I'm I'm pretty good at, and uh, it, it does have some of its benefits. And one of them is if you do have a softer paint vehicle. So typically, uh, Japanese vehicles are a little bit softer paint. Uh, Teslas are real soft paint, for example. Um, those, they will scratch easy. They'll swirl easy, but they don't chip. And then you can get vehicles that are like, I think Volvo is, is medium to hard paint. Um, Volvos are harder paint. Uh, most German cars are harder paint. And those, they will chip, but they are harder to scratch so on vehicles hmm. that are the soft paint you can add like a ceramic coating and typically depending on the coating that you use they advertise that in 9h hardness on most american vehicles or german vehicles it's it's useless as far as protecting it from a hardness standpoint but there is a benefit on softer paint that um you can typically withstand just a little bit more abuse on like a road rash or whatever something like hitting a tree branch on a Tesla, I mean, that thing will just go right through the paint like it's nothing. It, it'll polish yeah. out, um, but the ceramic coating would probably protect it a little bit more. And you can you can ceramic coat on top of your paint protection film as well. 
Um, I heard of that. And it, it will add, you know, extra, um, you know, protection and stuff. If you want it all the way around. Um, it, and it lasts for, you know, depending on what you get. If you get like the real pro- professional grade, I wouldn't recommend that because you're, you're, you're paying for a product that really isn't giving you much more protection over another one. It's supposed to be a lifetime coating, but it's only a lifetime yep. if you maintain it month to month to month or quarter to quarter, mm-hmm. whatever the, the, um, the, the vendor tells you to go. But if you get like the commercial grade coatings, like there's G Technic, uh, Crystal Serum Light, there's uh, C Quartz, all these other manufacturers, they'll last two, three, four, five years, depending on which one you get. And uh, if you properly maintain it, you're someone who washes your car once, uh, uh, you know, every other week, it'll last its its full duration and stuff. But uh, definitely, if you're trying to get into something like that, it's it's well worth it. It's not too expensive. It, you can do it yourself too. You don't have to be an expert to ceramic coat your vehicle. But preparation is a key. If you're if you don't prep your vehicle at all, it's it's useless to put on there. Um, but if it's, you know, a vehicle that did get repainted, then definitely it's something one of the first things that I always recommend to customers is uh, get that thing protected. Even if you're not using an experiment coating, a high quality sealant um, is, is probably the next step down from there that, that I would recommend. Good to know. Thank you. Yeah. So if you want to avoid the cowboy pinstripes, the ceramic coating is a good idea. A little bit. Yeah. If it's a softer paint, definitely. All right. Well, uh, if somebody's out watching this and they drive a Tesla out here, I definitely want you coming on, and I definitely want to see. <laughs> <laughs> That's I mean, I've seen a Prius doing some weird stuff on these roads. Yeah, I mean, Tesla, it, no. it, it depends. So, like black vehicles, their paint is typically a little bit softer than any of the other colors, anyways. I, I don't know why they they do that. Maybe because black, you do see all the defects, so they. They want yep. to go ahead and and, and and let it get some swirls here or there because they don't want it just to chip, so they maybe will go with a little bit of a softer uh, uh, softer paint. But most American vehicles, they are going to be medium-ish paint, so you will get road rash. They will swirl whenever you, you know, if you use a low-quality towel, wiping your vehicle off or whatever. Um, but, you know, you can polish it out pretty quickly. You don't need real strong tools uh, polishing tools to do it like uh, i mean in my arsenal i have these microfiber cutting discs and stuff and and it, on some clear coats like i just did a, a volkswagen and the pads that i had wouldn't work i had to wet sand the vehicle to actually restore it because it, it just it would take me forever to polish that vehicle using a da polisher using a microfiber cutting pad because usually when you polish you go like an inch a second um, that's usually the golden rule when polishing and it, it, I had to go over 10 passes and it didn't do anything to the paint, but I, I, I use, you know, 5,000 grit, um, sandpaper and it'll go through it in, in a heartbeat and then you just polish it out after. So it, there's a lot, eventually maybe one of these times we can do a live stream of, of talking about like, Hey, how to protect your, your vehicle when you go down on a, on a trail or whatever, or whenever you get back, what we, what we can do for it. But it'd be nice to do like a stream just in that and stuff. There's all kinds of content I can go into. That's a great idea. How we put that down the list? I've even heard of recently some type of. I heard of some type of wrap that is a Kevlar wrap that's supposedly really, really tough, but it's like three or four thousand bucks. But it's yeah, meant for like have, off-road abuse. I have heard of that, and also the new kid on the block is using graphene coatings, and so basically the stuff mm. that's in your pencils. Graphene is also the next upcoming. It may eventually replace ceramic coatings. I don't know. There's products already out there. How much of a benefit does it really give you? I, I don't know, but there's graphene coatings out there now. Um, but yeah, your Kevlar ones, it, it's paint protection and film, and um, it's not self-healing, but it is much better at protecting. Supposedly. Is it self-healing? Really? Correct. Paint protection film, will, can, you can get some that will um, self-heal. So basically, it, it will basically re-adhere to the uh to the paint if it gets like yeah, a rock hits it and it kind of shreds it a little bit it will re-adhere back some of them you have to do it yourself like maybe with the heat gun for example other ones it just kind of self-heals you can look it up it's it's some interesting stuff eventually I'll, I'll end up trying to do that too but um 
I don't have enough uh, out here in California. I don't have enough of a market or enough of an interest for people to start doing paint protection film. And it's a lot, a lot of stuff that you probably need an actual shop to do. I mean, you can do it yourself. You can buy the paint protection film. You can lay it on yourself and do it. But for me, it's, it's not a, it's not cost efficient for the customer or typically worth, worth the time that I want to do to get something so tedious. And for me, I mostly specialize in, 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 the paint correction and paint polishing and, and paint protection part as far as actually using, um, you know, coatings and, and sealants, waxes, things like that. But it's, it's interesting out yeah, there. I forget what the name of it is. Uh, Expel is, is a big one. Expel is, uh, I don't know if theirs is self healing. There's one, it's like sun micro or sun something. I forget what it is. Sun tech. Sun tech is uh, the one I think that's self healing. If I remember right. And I got to apply it on vehicles. Like it was pretty much if you're if you're driving a sports car, it, most people went with the paint protection film, mostly on the front end. But then on the back end, everywhere or everywhere else on the vehicle, they went ahead and put ceramic coating on it, just because it, it really does. It makes your vehicle like it does make it look better. It does give it like a candy shine. Um, but ultimately, like comes to the maintenance of the vehicle. You know. You, you drive it, you know, for the day, go to a car show or whatever, and it gets all dusty. You don't need to take your, you know, your duster off. And you may, you know, scratch it or whatever. It won't do anything to it with a ceramic coating on it. But you can get that thing home and, and you're like, okay, it's time to put it back in, in the garage. You can just rinse that sucker off and it'll be good. You know, all the dirt that you accumulated on it, you can just rinse right off. And you can use ceramic coatings on, uh, a lot of times you can use it on your headlights. You can use it on, um, uh, most of your plastic trims they do have some that are supposed to be for plastic trim but typically um some of that you get you can use on pretty much all surfaces um but there's you know wheel coatings if you wanted to get them um Gion makes a rim type coating that's real popular I, I go an easier route like usually i just use a specific type of uh spray on rinse off type um wheel protection because i don't foresee it lasting you know, even with a, a proper protection on, on your rims, I don't see it lasting more than like six months to a year. So I'd rather get the spray on, rinse off, and just give you a few weeks of protection um, just because it's something that's it's not going to adhere to um, too much abuse. But if it's a show car, yeah, you'd, you can protect that thing and just drive it out every once in a while and come back home, rinse your vehicle off, and it'll be like it's brand new. You don't even have to really wash the thing. It does a good job. I think I should look into it more. Yeah, it's it's worth it. If you have a shop, do it. It's it's a lot of it's a lot of money. I would recommend trying to find a, um, a local detailer to do it. Or or uh, yeah, I, from what I learned, it's definitely best that someone that does it regularly do it because yeah, like you said, the prep job is very important, huh? It's, correct. It's, it's, it's not something you just throw on in the afternoon. You definitely got to take the right yeah, steps. Yeah, yeah. You know, you do have it correctly. To, uh, um, it, it typically takes you know, like if I do a vehicle, a, a normal sized vehicle, typically takes me. Uh, about eight to ten hours to do a vehicle, and most of it's into the prep work. Uh, you prep work mm -hmm. for me is almost on the the car itself. Um, it is anywhere from four to six hours, depending on like what type of correction you need to be done to the car. Um, single, you know, if it's single step correction or if it's a multi step correction. But most vehicles, newer vehicles, or ones that are repainted, it's single step, so about four hours to do, um, and then the coating itself is about two hours. Dang. Well, we can avoid the cowboy uh, pinstripes that way. Um, so I'm looking at this picture here. That is this. Uh, this looks like a different view from a picture we were looking at earlier, almost. But um, certainly manageable in your car. Yeah, it was pretty wavy, lumpy road, but yeah, certainly manageable. It's it's fun driving those roads, especially. It's amazing when you air down your tires and driving these rough roads. It's so much more smoother than driving on the pavement when your pressures are high. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it soaks uh, up all the little stuff, and it's kind of rolly and wavy, but it's not bumpy or harsh or like you know anything well, washboard. Yeah. You don't feel any of that. It's just nice and mellow, smooth. We haven't covered airing tires down much on this channel, but absolutely, uh, when I had my Toyota, I'd go down to like maybe twenty because I wanted. I didn't carry an air compressor, so I had to make it back into town to fill my tires up, so I never went all that low. But definitely airing down your tires not only gives you more traction, but the tires will absorb some of the bounce from all the irregularity in the roads and make your ride a lot mm -hmm. smoother. 
Um, I've heard of guys being like stuck in sand and snow and airing them down to I think as low as like eight psi, just enough to keep the bead from popping and crawling out, uh, thinking they were stuck, but then getting out. So um, airing down. I've, I've heard of the same thing, being stuck and dropping your pressures in some, and it actually gives you enough grip to get out of it. Yeah, yeah. and it, that comes from experience. It also comes from the type of tire. Um, my Unfortunately, the truck I drive, I'm not allowed to air my tires down because they're for a heavy-duty truck. Uh, the lowest I'm allowed to go is like 50. <laughs> so uh, yeah. it doesn't do me a whole lot of good, but I'm also running highway terrains, not off-road tires. So there is that aspect to it. Um, but definitely, if you're looking for a smoother ride, if you have something that's meant for an all-terrain that's got larger uh, sidewalls, definitely lower your air pressure. Maybe ask the uh, dealer you bought them from uh, what uh, air pressure to run them at, but definitely a smoother ride for sure and better traction. So, uh, but again, there's so many variety of tires. Ask the place you bought them for what they recommend for that one. I don't want to send false information that's not true or correct. Um, Let's see here. Uh, I, I did. I did drop my pressures down to twenty pounds in front, twenty-two in rear, and uh, which is still pretty safe. Having no bead locks. I know a lot of the real four-wheeler guys have bead locks. They'll often go down to about ten pounds, but going that low with no bead locks, you risk popping your bead and losing your air pressure. So twenty so, pounds seemed great for me, and yeah, I was amazed how smooth it rode. My question comment for that would be i was i'm under the impression and i have not looked this up so i'm not an authority on it but i thought bead lockers were not legal in california nope true bead locks are not legal on the street you see a lot of faux bead locks but real bead locks are not street legal okay so we there's a little a little tidbit we all learned today but yeah that, I, that, that. I was almost gonna get the bead locks no they're not legal on the road you might be able to roll around on them, but if they if they catch you, I don't know if it fix a ticket or what, but definitely not street legal. Yeah, well, if we go together, you can throw them in the back of my truck. We'll put them on when we get there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I ended up getting some more flashy rims instead because that's what the wife wanted. So uh, a little bit of bling. Yeah, yeah. The, technically, the Jeep's hers. I I was never really into Jeeps too much. I, um, you know, I, I was more into the German cars. So I have a Mercedes. Um, that's what, you know, what I like to be into. And, uh, she wanted her dream car was a Jeep Wrangler and then I got it for her and I actually fell in love with it. Now I drive it whenever I get the chance because my Mercedes ended up being a lemon. It's actually getting bought back by Mercedes because it's just been nothing but a headache since I've had it. Like solar oh, exploded probably. within the first two weeks. Uh, like the, the AC quit on it. The, uh, the airbag lights come on from the driver's side and the passenger side. The sunroof quit working, like all kinds of issues within like every week there was something. <laughs> they get into the shop, get fixed, drive it off, something will quit the next day. Was you it know, built on a Monday after a holiday or was it built on a Friday right before a holiday? <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I'm pretty sure I got one of the first ones off the lot. And uh, I, it's the worst decision I've made. Like, I, you know, I, I like my German cars and stuff, but that was my first Mercedes and I'll never get another one after that. <laughs> nope. Oh. No. Uh -oh. they, they ruined its experience. They were like, I, I try to let them buy it back and and uh, like, hey, you know, how about you try to, you know, make it worthwhile to keep you in keep me in the in the brand, right? You want to keep me. They offered like fifteen hundred dollars, I think, in, in credit if I would purchase another Mercedes. I'm like, that's not worth my time. Like all the time that I spent driving and and, and I moved from San Antonio, Texas, and the Mercedes dealership I bought it from was it was in traffic. It was about an hour, you know, one way. You know, I don't know how many tips I, made, I trips I made there, and they realized like, oh, sorry, the AC unit got a new redesigned part. Where you know we'll have to ship that back, and I left empty-handed. It just it, they ruined the experience, and they're just going to try to reimburse it about fifteen hundred dollars, and you know, in in credit to get another one. It's like no thanks. I'll take my That's business. Awesome. That's not enough. They're still yeah. making money off the thing. Maybe if you can prove to me you're breaking even on it, I personally might consider it. But yeah, they were they're just gonna buy it back. So and that's the other, you know, sticky side of it. Not to get off topic, but um they're willing to buy the vehicle back, but then they don't have any problems getting it lemon law. So they're basically just buying it back for what I paid for it. They can turn around, fix it, and then 
put it on some other poor soul. And I, to me, no. that's that's shady. And, and I'm like, if if they don't make this a very smooth experience, I'm just gonna be like, I'd rather take the time to lemon law it because I know it will get lemon lawed. I know I will win on it. You'll lose out. You'll get the sticker on it being a lemon law and not make you know all your money back uh, close to it. You'll have to lose money on that vehicle. And because I lost money on my precious time, and time is worth money. I'm okay with it at that point. And, yeah. you know, I, I've been close to, to going down that route, but at this point, like, I just, I want to wash my hands with it and be done. No, I get it. I, it makes sense to me. Um, I'll probably end up getting a Tesla mm -hmm. <laughs> six times. Me being a techie at the same time, I'll probably move to a Tesla. Um, X country asked if there's any for, if I have any forest picked out in NC. Uh, and that would be more a question for you, Dylan, because you've actually been there. I've only been to Riley, North Carolina to put on a tiny house workshop for a weekend. So uh, we were supposed to go out there right before COVID really got bad when they're starting to talk about shutting the airlines down. Uh, we were supposed to go out there, but we canceled the trip because I didn't want to get stuck out in North Carolina. That would be terrible with no income whatsoever, no place to stay but an Airbnb. So um, I don't know if you've got any recommendations. I don't want to get too far off the topic. Uh, in another state that far off, but I don't know. Have you? It, what's your opinion of the forest out there? Um. So yes. Yeah, so, so I was out there for for a while. I was more in this the, the South Carolina territory, but it was like northern South Carolina close. It, it it was all the same. I loved the Carolinas. I'll be honest. You know, I was really impressed. The the food was good. The cost of living wasn't too high. Um. It was really nice. But there's, I think. Uh, Pisgah National Forest is a very popular one. Um, I don't know how to say the next one. It's like Uwari, U W A H R I E, something like that. It's a real popular one. And then, and then there's like Nantahala, or something I think is also a popular uh, national forest as well. Um, those three are, I, I don't know where you're going to be at in North Carolina and not, but those three. North Carolina is not a huge state anyway, so depending on where you're at in North Carolina, you can pretty much get to any three of those and not be out a huge drive no matter what. And you'll have tons and tons of opportunity out there. Um, they're great. It's You don't have to worry about the fire ban, you know, like what California has to. You can pretty much have a fire out there all year round, um, provided it's, it's not like a crazy uh, – crazy drought area but north carolina south carolina they typically get um you know a decent amount of rain so you don't typically have to worry about that um but yeah definitely those three i could put it in the chat if you guys want it's because right? i know how to spell it i just don't know how to pronounce it so it's <laughs> yeah. it know what that's like um well oops autocorrect so i'm on an ipad so it's it's uh, autocorrecting Oh, uh, okay. Um, Eric, is this another campsite you stayed at? This would be Monday Memorial Day when I'm heading home, and uh, I was scouting for future campsites. So I saw some inroads on the map near the top of Bartlett Springs Road, and that's where I'm at now. And there were some beautiful campsites there, amazing views, some of the best I saw anywhere. But there was probably six or so campsites where you could just about throw a stone at the near near campsites and they're all dispersed campsites like this is but they were awfully close together i guess you want to be with a bunch of friends you could be kind of camping near each other but uh <laughs> amazing views beautiful spot but i imagine it also packs up kind of quick since it's right off bartlett springs road not far from clear lake you know pretty easy yeah. access and actually uh, uh yeah, you might be surprised amazing that, views uh, up here there's a couple of shots i took of you might be a little surprised about that. Uh, most people going through Walker Ridge, very few going through Bartlett Springs. People do go in through Bartlett Springs, but far more huh. coming through Walker Ridge. Um, the, and then they're going to the reservoir, or no? You they connect. You can actually uh, that uh, I found the several campsites by coming in through Walker Ridge, and that's how I discovered that Bartlett Springs connects back up with the twenty. So you can do a loop all the way around. Um, but uh yeah a lot of guys uh the map is uh google will send you in that way if you're going to the reservoir and most people when you ask them oh how do you get to any valley reservoir they're all going to tell you uh our walker ridge road um 
One road that very few people know about is uh, Bear Valley Highway 16. Off of the 20, you can kind of come in east of the reservoir up the hill. It's a really weird road. It's dirt and it goes straight and then a hard left and then straight and then a hard right and then straight and a hard left and a straight. It's really crazy. Look, look it up on a map. Uh, I did it in my Subaru and it was a lot of fun. Um, it's real smooth, real, real smooth. So you could fall backside. And then it goes up the hill and you get to the top of the hill and you can overlook the whole reservoir. It's pretty cool. Um, so if you want another route to get into any Valley Reservoir area, look up Bear Valley Highway 16. Um, but for me, if I'm going into Indian Valley Reservoir, I'm going to take Bartlett Springs Road because I just, I, I want to get off the highway. I don't want to keep going down the 20 heading east to get to Walker Ridge Road and then go even further to get to Bear Valley Road or Bear Valley Highway 16. Um, I'll hit Walker Ridge Road and go in that way because I just, again, I want to get off of the pavement. I want to be away. Um, but most of the traffic is going to come in through Walker Ridge Road. Um, and as far as where I'm going, uh, Chapel Hill area, which is, I'm not sure where. Um, so I think we're going to, this is the same spot, just kind of rotated. Uh, yes, exactly. This, yeah, this, and this campsite had another fire pit kind of right near it in a nice little spot. This, but yeah, look at the views up there. I mean, it's kind of hard to tell in the photo, but you can see really far in every direction. If I turned around, if I could do a 360 photo, the other direction, you're looking at Clear Lake. I mean, there's amazing views up here. There's another UFO in this picture. Definitely. Where'd it go? Check that out. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really big B. <laughs> oh, <that's, laughs> Funny. I, I didn't. Uh, I, I my as a photographer, my, my eye catches a lot of that kind of stuff. It's like mm, interesting. All right. Um, I well, so that's about it for the photographs. Um, Pretty much. This, we've been on for a really long time and oh here's a panorama what's this one um more than two and a half hours yeah i would uh say that i'm I, i'm uh grateful that uh dylan and eric came on tonight and have spent this copious amount of time tonight um and i'd love to continue but it is getting 10 <laughs> 36 so unfortunately, I'm going to call it, but uh, let me go back to this view here before I keep talking here. Blah, blah, blah. Stream, yards go here. Blah, blah, blah. How do we do this one? There we go. Um, say that uh, thanks to everybody for watching. Uh, it's been a great show. The view count was higher than it's been, uh, I think, in the last couple of shows. Dylan, you've been a part of them, and we're holding at nine still. Uh, we hit 20 at one point. Comments have been flying through. So uh, I hope we can keep this kind of trend going. This channel is definitely growing. Um, let's see. Uh, again, uh, thumbs up means a lot. Comments mean a lot. Uh, if you found any of this information useful, please consider subscribing. Uh, we're going to be launching a video tomorrow about radios, uh, two-way radios. Uh, and then um, next Tuesday, I have a gentleman coming on, and we're going to be discussing uh, radios more in depth. He's a uh, technician licensed ham operator. Uh, I don't think he's the next step up from amateur. He's going to come on and help me with some of the, you know, how many watts you allowed to broadcast on, finding different frequencies. Um, so next Tuesday is about radios. Uh, and if you are into dispersed camping or camping or finding places to swim or whatnot, where's your pin starts at 8 p.m. for this coming Thursday. Uh, Dylan, if you're available, great. Eric, if you're available and can find, let's see, you're over this way. I don't know like which way to point here. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> if you guys are available and have some pins, that'd be fantastic. Um, if viewers have pins, that's even that's not necessarily even better, but that's fantastic too, because we can all work together to find spots that work uh, and find new places you probably never even knew existed, or a new spot that might be your new favorite place. Um, if we can work together to share these locations, it makes everybody's life a little bit better in more places and more dispersed COVID uh, social distancing, dispersed camping stuff. So, um, with that said, uh, I'm going to say. Thank you for all the viewers watching. Thank you for the comments. Uh, you gentlemen, if you would hang on for just a moment, I would be grateful. Um, and cheers to everybody watching. Thanks, everyone. And